So I will call this meeting to order. If we could please have a moment of silence. And uh, the flag salute, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, of the United States, States of America, of America and, to the and to the Republic for which it stands, stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, great. Thank you. Um, may we have the roll call vote, please? Yes. Mm, Mr. Calaguire? Here. Ms. Darmo? Here. Mr. Dovey? Here. Mr. Je Mr. Cameron Jenkins? Present. Mr. Phil Jenkins? Ms. Karamanujian? Yes. Mr. Litwack? Here. Mr. McLaughlin? Here. Uh, Ms. Terzich Keeley? Present. May we have the reading of statement of adequate notice, please? Public notice of this meeting pursuant to the Open Public Meetings Act has been given as follows. By advertising the Burlington County Times and the Career Post, September 9, 2021. Posting notice on the school bulletin board to main entrances on September 9, 2021. Posting notice electronically on the district website on October 5, 2021. While following written notice the, with the clerk of Delanco Township on September 9, 2021. Thank you. Do we have any public comment on any agenda items? Um, Ms. Karmanugian, I see that Mr. Jenkins entered the meeting. Thank you. Mr. Phil oh, Jenkins. Good. Oh, there he is. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Also, Mrs. Karmanugian, if, if you're okay with this, I would just request that everyone mute themselves unless you're the one speaking because I'm I'm hearing a lot of feedback. I'm not sure everyone else is experiencing that. Yeah, that sounds a smidge better. Okay, um, do we have any public comment on an agenda item? I'll go through and see if I see any hands. I just do not see any hands at this time. I will move this on for the work session, the presentation and uh, the finance presentation exhibit B. Steve, I will put this in your hands now and mute myself. Give me one second. Can everyone see that? Yeah, can you go into presentation mode so it's the text? Yeah, um, yeah. Cool. No problem. I'm in Google, so it's there it is. There. You know, I, initially I wasn't going to do a presentation this month, but I, I felt like it was important to update a few things that did happen, um, especially given some things that are coming up. So, real quickly, just like I've been giving the last couple of months, just an update on tuitions. We did receive, if you notice, there are three missing contracts. Three contracts are coming for people that were unexpected in the last week, week and a half. So if you notice the bottom line with tuitions, we're now technically at capacity, I guess you could say. We're technically under over budget. So that's something which is obviously concerning. I'll get I can give you more, more information on that in November when things kind of solidify with this. But uh that's definitely obviously a change from the last couple meetings where that was that was in the positive. So I do want to mention that the pending ones. I, I, I did talk to our case manager. There are preschool students potentially who are not eligible yet, but will be eligible throughout the school year at some point. The good thing about preschools are not usually as expensive. So in terms of the budget, it, as much as five people is a lot of money, it won't be the full, I guess, what we normally think of since it is preschool related. So the audit, the auditors came in, I guess about starting three weeks ago and they wrapped up about a week ago. The audit's not done, but they wrapped up their field work at least. Uh, so anyhow, we have, we have our budget fund balance that we have to make a decision on. 
it's not a decision we have to have a board resolution on because the board resolution was passed last June. Just need to know what the board agrees to in, in regards to this. So again, our budget each year is has a budget fund balance. And what that technically is, is technically surplus from a previous budget year, budget, in the, budget in the, into another year. So for example, if you look at this over the last couple of years, our budget of fund balance has, has usually been over a million. The reason, one of the, one of the big reasons why our budget in 21-22 was needed, needed rifts and cuts was because of that significant difference in the budget of fund balance which means things happened in that budget year two years ago, which would be 1920. Something happened, so stuff happened in that year that caused you know, that fund balance to dip down. Now in 22-23, we look like we have a strong fund balance, which is good. Now, that was partially due to probably less sub costs, less transportation costs, all because of COVID. So in some ways, COVID probably helped us out in, in regards to last year's budget. But the other thing we have to keep in mind is 2324. If our budget fund balance is only 424,000 in this year, what is our budget fund balance going to be, especially given that our tuitions are already over budget? What's our budget fund balance going to be in 2324? So before we just say let's budget all of $1.4 million to 2223 salaries and, and, and expenditures that have a yearly rollover. We got to be careful that we're not setting ourselves up for a bad 23-24 year. So here's kind of what I outlined here. And this is just a recommendation as of October 13, 2021. The only thing we really have to discuss is how much you want to put in capital reserve. Because once that decision is made, we can't go back on that. Everything else, we don't have to make a decision on. I'm just simply outlining this as simply as a framework for the conversation. So out of the 1.4 million, in June, there was a resolution that was passed saying we can put up to $250,000 into capital reserve. We can put, we don't have to put 250, we can put anything less than that, we just can't put more. And once we tell the auditors that they'll adjust our budget fund balance based on that. As I mentioned in the previous slide, I wanna be very careful. I wanna start reducing the budget fund balance to an appropriate, to a level that is, that is, healthier for our budget so that we have sustainability in our budget. The, the issue is that has to be done over time. You can't just cut it down to 300,000 and expect to survive. I have some initial budget work done. I believe $950,000 would allow us to put the facility department back into the budget, would allow us to put extra cricketers back into the budget, things of that nature. So I thought that was a healthy idea. I also have the 250 of that. We need to develop our preschool disabled program and an MD program for Joe Cricket from along three to six, third to sixth grade. Um, we need startup costs for that just to get the program started. And hopefully once we get the program started, those would be one-time expenditures because in the future years, we would see the benefit by the reduction in out of district tuitions. So in reality, what I'm trying to say here is 950,000 would be like reoccurring. And that 250 hopefully would go away because the savings on the out district placements would then hopefully overtake those programs, if not more. Yeah, that leaves us with, with $92,000, which I would just say we use for one-time expenditures. For example, we have to analyze whether or not we may need a bus, things of that nature. Things that would not impact a 23, 24 school year if the surplus is lower. So again, we're not deciding today if, because it's not the budget, not, it's not the final budget yet. I wanted to kind of put a framework for you. The, the only thing I need to know is if, if the board would like to put however much money up to $250,000 in capital reserve. So with that, I open up to questions before I go forward. Um, Mr. Burns, I have a question. Vera yes. Darmo. Um, I believe when I was looking over, um, some of the information in the budget packet. We have zero dollars in emergency capital reserve. Is that correct? We don't have an emergency reserve now. So aren't we supposed to have money in there in case we have an emergency or what is the guidance on that? No, you would have you would have had to put that on the June agenda. At this time you can now put it into a reserve outside of what was on the resolution in June. 
So should we have done that in your professional opinion? Um, I mean, it's hard for me to go back. I mean, I don't want to talk about the past. I've never done an emergency reserve in my, in my workings in Haddon Heights and Haddon Field. We did a maintenance reserve. Uh, that's something if we had significant surplus, I probably would move, like to move on because it allows you, what it allows you to do is if you put money in there, you have more freedom to take it out versus capital reserve. And it can be used oh, okay. for maintenance expenditures, which means let's pretend you had a bad budget year. You could actually, um, it doesn't work as much. You could at least replace your facility costs, which might be 50 to 75,000 in the budget, at least by using that reserve. So are you saying we do have a maintenance reserve you, now? No. Or? I was just commenting on what, if, if, I had, if I had a significant surplus this year above the amount that we needed to keep the budget going, that's something which I probably would put on, my, put on next June agenda if that happened. So capital reserve, that's for building school facilities, correct? Yes, capital projects. So since, since we don't have any plans to do that that I know of, why not put some of that money into that maintenance um, emergency maintenance that you're talking about. You cannot because it wasn't on the June, June agenda. Okay. Okay. So yeah, if after, we, after, I think I asked yeah. this before, like if we do have an emergency, then what's going to happen is because of the time sensitive nature, nature of emergencies, you're just going to be authorized without a vote to just go spend that money and then come back and, and deal with it. Is that correct? From capital reserve. From, from where? where you know, for like, say we have, I think I asked this like a long time ago, like say a boiler was to explode. We can't go, you know, we just need to spend that money immediately to fix that. So where does that money come out of? The general fund. The general fund. Okay. So there's no special procedure that needs to be followed. Uh, yes. That just is immediately. If it's emergency, true emergency, there is emergency contracts that you, can, you have to be able to, there is a procedure for emergency contracts, yes. But the funding would have to come from that. I can tell you right now, Capital Reserve has very strict measures to take it out. And the best, really the easiest way is really only a budget time. So for example, if you, if you knew you were replacing a boiler or something like that, you put it in the actual budget and take the money out then ahead of time. Not really ahead of time. We don't have any plans to do any sort of capital projects, correct? I mean, I was looking for our long-term um, I forget the exact name of it, a long-term facilities planning, never long, could find long, that. Yeah, so the long, the so we don't plan. have any plans for that, right? Is that correct? It has to have things, there, there's projects in it for sure. There's always projects in it, otherwise you can't have a capital reserve. But uh, so what always, kind of projects do we have? I'd have to ask the architect to see what was put in. I haven't, I haven't been here long enough to know what, the, what, what is put in there. But okay. what there is always board approved prior to putting it in there. Okay, so that was that was approved, uh, I think, before I got on the board. So that's why I want to know what's in there. So if you, yeah, if, for example, if you're thinking of go, let's pretend we're thinking of bond. Right? I, if you don't mind, I'll talk about my previous district, just because it allows me to give you concrete examples. For example, mm -hmm. um, the, there was several times where there was board resolutions to place things into the LRFP because they had ideas that they, they have wanted to do in the future. Now, it wasn't something they were gonna do immediately, but in, in, they knew in the next five years, they would have to. So in order to start developing those plans, they were to, to do that. The one thing that's important though with the capital reserve is, you don't know when things are gonna come up. Let's pretend we had an ADA accessible issue that we had to address and we had to get the architect involved. You know, there are things that, there are things that may come up in the next two or three years that, we don't, that aren't on our radar right now that we may need to pull from capital reserve for. So that's why you'd want to place money into it. Just because you don't have it on your radar today doesn't mean it won't be on your radar tomorrow. Okay. Um, does anybody here on the board or the superintendent remember what some of our long range uh, projects are since I haven't seen that document? Anybody remember like we're, we might want to build uh, whatever, anybody know? Okay, let's move on then. What's the balance of the capital reserve right now? You know, I should have that with me, but I don't have the audit in front of me, but it should be around 400,000, I believe. I have it somewhere. I can, I can get that to you tomorrow if, um, if, you, if you want to know the exact amount. 
Uh, what's a what's a healthy amount that you recommend? It depends on the district. Um, well, like, a district like ours. <laughs> it, it, it depends on what your goals are. So for example, like Haddonfield, we were building up our capital reserve because we were doing a big project to to um, build an air handling uh, thing. So we wanted significant money there. Um, Haddon Let's, Height. Haddon sorry, Height, just can you just yeah. quantify significant money? A million, like probably about a million and a half they're putting in there okay. at the time, because that project was going to cost that much money. You know, um, Haddon Heights probably had around four hundred thousand, similar to you, but we were trying to expand it at the end because there were some projects that were coming up that we knew would probably cost one to one point five. So, obviously, I didn't. I'm not. Well, I'm not there for the audit, but I would say that if they followed my recommendations, they're probably around one to one point two million now but I can't say for sure. So my, so my point being is it depends on the projects. I, I wouldn't put the 250. I, I, I personally, as much as, you know, as much as it, it's always nice to put money in reserve, I, I, I still, I think we can all agree that the budget from last year is still leaving us a little uncomfortable. So I would like a little bit of give. Um, that's why like, if, if you want to put 100, I, I think we should put something in there. I'm not saying it has to be 250. I'm not actually not saying it all has to be 250. But um, capital projects creep up on you. And when you least expect it, you need to do something, especially when you have an old building like Walnut. So you never know what's going to happen. And one project could easily be $100,000, $150,000. You know, so I, I have a follow-up question on that topic. Um, yeah. so let's just say, completely hypothetically, we planned to... We, yeah, to, to do a referendum next year for a capital project. Um, if we were basically, if that was the plan to get, to get more money in the pot for, for capital, for a specific capital project, would it make sense to maybe put less into the capital reserve this year so that we could have it available for other things? Uh, would that be the, the I, love, I, love, I actually love that question. Um, so it depends on the board. This is, this, is why, this is why I have to bring it to the board. So the Let's pretend you went out for like a $5 million bond referendum. You could say, we're going to use all of our money in capital reserve to offset some of the cost. That way it doesn't hit the taxpayers as hard. So like some boards would say, having the capital reserve allows us to ask for less money from the taxpayers, therefore increasing taxes less. That could be a benefit. Other people would say, if we're going to borrow $5 million, what does it matter if it's 4.5 or 5? Was, yeah, it wouldn't make sense. So a bond referendum was probably, if you were to start a bond referendum process, you're talking two to three years away, probably. Gotcha, okay. That, I, I, as a really, I mean, Stephen, that's, I, I really love that question. Mm -hmm. It's a good one. Steve, this is Phil. I like your recommendations for fund balance. I think it looks very good. Thank you. Hello? Yes. Hello. You muted yourself again, Harry. You were off. Harry, you. you... Hold me. There you go. There you go. Okay. Um, right now, you're saying we have four hundred thousand in that capital reserve. It's Probably. around there. I, I have to check the exact number because that was a question that I had. So then we'd be riding with about half half a million in there more or less. That, so that's one place where we possibly can move money. And I think historically for years, what schools would do is every year they would put in the budget to put in an, on a new roof that they never put on. So they always had that money every year to keep moving forward and use whatever they needed it for until many years ago when they had the Jersey school uh, building act, et cetera, that went forward. And even now, if we're looking at the possibility of uh, bonding for a specific purpose of building onto a school or creating a totally new school, I believe it's 40% that the state will cover. So that's something to, to understand rather than all on the taxpayers. But um, and a bond, there's a lot of political energy that needs to go into having a bond succeed. 
Um, Steve, going back to the very first page, uh, Riverside, where they built quarterly. Is that, am I correct? Because it was the update upon. Harry, I'm sorry, my internet went down in the middle of everything you said. Steve, Harry was just asking whether Riverside bills quarterly. They bill monthly. If I miss anything else, I'm sorry. Again, I apologize. Harry's frozen too. Anything? No, he's he's gone. Um, like I said, we we can pick we can pick the one fifty, or we can like I said, we can lower to one hundred if that's what everyone's more comfortable doing. It gives us a little extra money to play with. I would just stress if we do that, we make sure we keep it for one time costs in the budget, because once we do salaries, that's reoccurring. I really think we're, we would be, I think we'd be very careful about reoccurring costs. Uh, we're gonna, we need some of it to cover reoccurring costs, but we're not gonna have $1.4 million in 23, 24 uh, to cover that, kind of right now, so. So I don't know if Mercy, you want to get a quick consensus on that, just to kind of see where people are at. I can absolutely. It's not, vote. It's, not vote. it's not a vote because they already voted. The board already voted for the up to two fifty. Normally, this would be done in committee level, which is right. why we would just decide and move on. That's yeah, why no. I, I can tell you right now, I feel comfortable with the number that you have presently noted in the presentation. I think that that's probably it's healthy. I think it provides us the flexibility to have additional monies elsewhere. I think if we put too much in there at this point in time and a project doesn't come up, that money, like you said, is not, we can't reallocate it. So it ties our hands. And as you had mentioned previously, we are in a, we're still in a, a tight budget situation. So it's better to have less money tied somewhere where we can't touch it um, as opposed to having a little bit of flexibility for you to be able to utilize in the event that something does come up and we may we do need to utilize it. So I like the number that you presented. I'm comfortable with maintaining at 150 and not going to the max. Um, Phil had mentioned that he too feels that same way. You know, I'm in agreement with that. Um, does anybody else have a differing opinion? Did you prefer there to be the max in there of 250? Please voice your opinion. If not, then I would assume that we all feel the same way, but please voice your opinion. This is Vera. I would like even less money. Let's reduce the tax burden. Then if we have to go out for a bond, the, the taxpayers can decide if they want to do that. So um, that's that's my opinion. Maybe lower it to 50,000. Harry, your hand was up. Go ahead. Hello. Yes. Is are you responding to me? Yes, I am. I'm, I'm saying I okay, hear you. Go. Please go. <laughs> so I, ha I have some questions that I was in the middle of asking that I got cut off. So I don't control that. Uh, yeah, I think are you able to still hear me? Yeah, just barely. You're going in and out. I think it's your internet. Okay. Well, that's why I was just trying to call so I'd at least be on the phone. But what, what my question to be that I was asking at that moment was how many payments does Riverside, how many, how often do they bill us? Monthly. Is that quarterly? The, excuse me? Monthly. That's monthly? monthly? Yeah. So the, the difference per month was 86,000? From the budgeted to the projected? 
Kelam. Hey, Steve, could you clarify which number Harry is referencing there? I think Steve is frozen too. He is. Yeah. You're talking about the, the numbers on the projected tuition cost slide, Harry? I'm talking about the projected tuition cost. Yeah, I think that's a yearly number because we budgeted that's one point. I'm eight. asking what. Yeah. I would, I would have right, to but uh, it was the note was updated upon first bill from Riverside. That's what I'm yeah. asking. That was yeah. Projected so Steve, from, I I can provide uh, some kind of answer here. Steve was just kind of dropped from the meeting because of his connection. But what happens is each year, the numbers do fluctuate when it comes to the tuition. Uh, first of all, there's a certified rate for tuition each year that causes the numbers to fluctuate because that that number is different from the projections. Then we also have a different number of students attending Riverside than might be than what might be originally projected. So sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. So Steve, we're talking about the Riverside tuition numbers and how those numbers can be different uh, from year to year, or how the projection could be different from what what actually is paid. Yeah, I mean they well. The way Riverside does is they adjust it monthly based on the enrollment. So if we have a lot of people transfer in in the month of August or October or whatever, it would change it would change it or vice versa. If a lot of people moved out in one month, it would change the bill as well. So by them adjusting it monthly, um, it it's kind of a, it's kind of good that we have less an adjustment at this at the end of the year or in the future year. But at the same time, yeah, it, that's you know, what I'm. Well, that's what. In other words, um, what I'm just looking at is because it was the first bill. So that's based on the first bill that was, I'm assuming September, correct? We did. We literally just got that bill like the other day. So that's not in the spreadsheet yet. I just haven't, we haven't covered 1.2 okay. million. Okay. And then, but, yeah. okay. And then, and, it looks like more kids went to BCIT yes, as yeah. regular ed students. And there, in my understanding, I don't think there's a difference in cost between special ed at BCIT and regular ed. And there's not, just the way you charge it. The special, yeah, yeah, that they break it out because of how they have to account for things. Um, and the no IDEA on this that's projected. So it's just that that's what we're getting. That's, what we're, that's what we're spending. I'm exactly. Okay. And then when I look at the fund balance, I had the same question as everyone else about that capital reserve, the fund balance. So that's what we have to figure out and decide. And if they're future capital projects, we have to come up with specifics other than what we've already in the pipeline of things that we've been talking about doing. And then um, I'm, I'm, I think that the special education program, the expansion of it, I'm curious how we came up with what those costs were and what are they for? And what, what are we doing that costs a quarter of a million dollars to expand upon? And does grant money exist like it does, I believe, for like preschool program costs, we're grant money, but we have to apply for it to get it. Am I off base with that or? I mean, there's the IDA grant, but that's that's a lot towards the out-of-district tuitions. These expansions would be reducing the out-of-district tuitions, hopefully, by keeping students in district with having those programs, such as an MD program and a preschool dis disabled program. Yeah, but... Yeah, the, 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 I, I mean, I don't under, I, I'm just trying to figure out what are those costs? I mean, startup costs, no, Harry, how they, Joe or? 
Harry, it's uh, it's Joe. If you can hear me, um, first of, in order to, to open up, yeah, a I can hear you. To staff it, and so hiring the teachers, a full time teacher plus benefits, uh, and and Steve is accounting for that. He's accounting for the need for instructional aides or um, clinical associates, uh, BCBA, RBTs, all sorts of things that might be needed for a classroom where we're bringing a population of students in that would otherwise be out of district in a different program. So if we look at that for pre-K, like Steve mentioned, and grades three to five, uh, which is another idea on the horizon, uh, those two programs, we need funds to start them up. And as Steve is saying, that will save money because number one, we're gonna be providing the services and the, the education to the students in district, and that's a benefit. Uh, and it'll save money when it comes to the tuition, the transportation, all sorts of things. Now, I, I personally understand that, which is great, but I don't understand if we're paying teacher salary year after year that it's a startup cost would be a one-time startup cost funded by the savings and future budget year. I mean, that's, that's the intent of the program ideally, but I don't, you know, if we're paying teacher salary under that, that we're adding teachers if we're doing that, correct? I just think we need to talk about and figure out that because it's also the preschool program too. I don't see anything in here about that. Do we have anything, a program cost for that as well? These are all just projections right now, Harry. We, we wouldn't know the exact cost. We know that we would be hiring a teacher, a full-time teacher at, at least, plus other staff members, uh, furniture, other resources that are needed, et cetera. Now, you are correct, though, in that not all the costs are one-time startup costs, that they would be recurring costs, but those costs would yeah, be that's why paid I'm by the, the to... saved money in tuition. Well, that's not a cost. Saving money isn't a cost. Uh, I'm, I'm trying, like I say, I spent, you know, a, a goodly number of years in special ed and private, and, you know, public schools. And that's what, um, you know, to start up the program, the 20, uh, you know, I'm glad we have it in there, but I'm trying to figure out you know, if we had to physically change rooms around or add things, those are one-time costs that I, I envision, you know, supplies, materials, um, design. Um, so it's in there, but I, I guess what I'm saying is that that's work ahead for us to figure out, the board, how, you know, that you, you, we're saying this is the tentative plan but then how does it shake out? You know, how does it actually occur? Well, Harry, it's actually simpler for the board than you think. The board simply has to say, Joe, we want a grades three through five in district self-contained program. And then I say, okay, I serve at the will of the board and we're going to make that happen. Now, the question is the timeline. Can we do that tomorrow? Oh, certainly not. But can we plan for that for next year? Yes. Yeah, and like I say, that um, so that, that everyone understands that clearly and that the work that that'll involve to make it a program where we do actually, uh, once it's set up, we do benefit and we receive um, benefits from not having to place our students out and also to bring in students with that same category and classification from other districts. Are, are you still able to hear me? It was, yeah. So I, I, that's what I'm trying to, to grasp conceptually where this takes us. And I, I'm, I know that you created, Steve, options for us, option one, option two, for, or, or I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I don't know what I missed. The ARP grant, ESSER funds, the 640,866, have we talked about that yet, or are we supposed to be talking about that yet? We just started talking about fund balance. That's it. 
Excuse me? Let's start talking about fund balance. Okay, then I'll hold that for, for later. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I can see um, your thought process behind it. So I appreciate that. It seems that it's, you know, you're, you've got the big picture pretty well organized. So thank you, Steve Burns. That's, uh, I'm, I'm good. Marissa, you're muted. Anybody else have any additional um, opposition to the existing outside of providing it to be less? Steve, do you have um, any advice if we were to lessen it to 100,000? Um, like, do you feel uncomfortable with that amount since you are the one that is dealing with the finances? What is your feel, I, your experience? I feel good about that. I shouldn't say I feel good. I feel good assuming nothing changes. Um, I feel like I can make the budget work for next year, you know, at, the, at this point in time. The one thing I must stress though is we can, we can say 150 today. I, I monitor the budget monthly pretty significantly. Like I try to generate our surplus calculation every month. And once October closes, I'll do the same thing again. If, and also I'm looking at the budget in November. As much as the auditors need an answer to this, Theoretically, the audit doesn't actually get inputted until December. So we can say tonight, okay, 150 looks good, but if I see a big issue, I'm gonna come right back to you and say, hey guys, something's not working out here. I think we should just change this. And the auditor is gonna be okay because they haven't inputted anything. I haven't certified anything. Nothing's gonna be official until that point. And it's just one number anyway, so. Right, I, I kind of feel comfortable with that, with waiting for more things to you know fall into place. Like you said, you were waiting for a couple of additional contracts to solidify to find out exactly where we stand budgetarily. I, I'd be comfortable with waiting an additional month until we set in stone exactly where we want to be in regards to that number. Um, does anyone oppose that? So I'll tell the auditors 150 for now and just tell them that we are gonna re-look at this and re-examine yes. it. And if nothing changes, I'll just come back and say, nothing really has changed. I feel comfortable with that. If something changes, okay. makes me uncomfortable, I'll tell you. Okay. Uh, I, I also, I'm, I'm more uncomfortable about the future budget years, to be honest with you, <laughs> than next year, which sounds crazy, but that's just, that's where I'm at. Understood. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, then we'll keep things as is for right this second until we see more things play out within the next month. And then once we have our next workshop meeting, we can discuss it again. And that can be the time where we put the stamp on it and say, yes, please submit this number and have this certified. So I feel like that's a really good decision. Yeah, I'm gonna to try to share this again. I think my presentation's yeah. off. Oh, uh, Joe, I need you to give me the right again. I apologize for my internet connection. I'm not sure because my hub is right in front of me. I'm not sure what's going on. Thank you. Uh, the last thing I wanted to real quickly show, uh, share with you is the ARP funds. The grants due November 15th. Uh, this is, there's been a lot of thought put into this, several meetings with the admin team and also with the association just to kind of talk things out. The option one, this is what um, Harry was referring to. Option one kind of says, well, in the ESSER two grant, we put the facility personnel partially in there. We put part of facility personnel benefits. We put maintenance, we put maintenance items, we put the counselor. Those top four things were all put in the ESSER two grant to help the budget this year. Obviously, we know we can't function without a custodial department. So we need to get that back into the general fund. So the goal in option two is to place that back into the budget, similar to like extracurricular activity and things of that nature for next year. And so that's, that's the biggest difference you'll see from column option one and option two. Option one 
has pretty much the status quo with the ESSER two grant put in for the ESSER, put in for the ARP grant. In option two, we're trying to put those, that money back into the budget. And instead, with that extra money, we're trying to do a few other things which are bolded at the bottom. And then if you look at the comment at the bottom, those bolded items would not be expended until at least December of 2022. Therefore, if we did have a budget crunch in 23-24, we could, we could submit an amendment to change that if we needed to, to help with that 23-24 budget. So the point being is the bolded items are what we all kind of agree are significant items that we need, but we do, uh, we do not feel comfortable earmarking it today without knowing 23-24's budget when this grant covers 23-24 as well. So for example, let's pretend we did have to have a tough budget year in 23-24. We could change the grant and then allocate those bolded items back to, if, you know, I hate, you know, if I hate to say this, but the facility personnel or facility personnel benefits, things of that nature. And they're about equal amount of funds, approximately. So here's some of the other items that we would like to do in the funds. Um, we have obviously facility maintenance. There's no doubt about it that the COVID costs have increased the HVAC filters, just making sure that our HVAC systems are working properly, just the disinfectants that we have to purchase, all of those things. We would like to keep that mostly funded like we do with the SR2 grant, just to kind of make sure that we have extra costs associated in case we have an uptick in those, in those costs. The one thing that we're really seeing a significant um, deficiency is the learning loss. Obviously, when students were at home, they did not learn as effectively as they would in a classroom. So to, to address the learning loss funds, we were gonna hire a basic skills teacher full-time for a portion of this year, once we would have the grant submitted and so forth, and for next year. So the next year and a half, we would try to address the learning loss by hiring a basic skills teacher. The extra custodian, we, we're, we've had issues, I've had issues in, other, in my other in my past district as well. When a custodian gets, gets COVID, God help, you know, God help us, but it, it happens. When they get quarantined, um, and just the fact that those positions are taking on so much extra cleaning and disinfecting, and they're not the same thing, that when someone does get quarantined or someone does get, get sick, we're really in a bind. So the idea with a hire would be to hire a part-time custodian that in 23, 24, we would get rid of. Hopefully COVID would not be an issue after one and a half years more of this, but we said that a year ago, so, so we'll see. But the idea, this would help us for the next year and a half to give our director of facilities a little extra room to help disinfect the buildings. On that same note, if you remember in the S in the uh, in the rifts last year, we rift a person, basically another maintenance person. So our current director of facilities cuts all of our lawns. He does all of our maintenance. And he also does custodial work at times, depending on what is needed. Uh, the hope is for spring and for next year to give him the relief to give him some relief. We didn't want to hire a position because if, in, if we can't support the position in 23, 24, we didn't want to get rid of it. But at least during this COVID environment, to give him some extra support with the extra custodian and the grounds contract, that would help him immensely focus on our HVAC systems, the maintenance, our roofs, things of that nature, and just being a director of facilities, which is already a full-time job in, its, in and of itself. If you're watching news, I think everyone's heard about, basically there's a worker shortage and building substitutes are trying, our, our attempt to try to address our substitute shortage. Obviously, we're not gonna solve all of our issues with this, but what we're trying to do is if we hire four people, two for, one for each building, but they're part-time positions, so we wouldn't have to pay benefits, so for example, if we told one person that they would be hired Monday, Wednesday, Friday, they would automatically be a substitute for those days. And on, on Tuesday, Thursday, we'd hire the other person. That would, that would guarantee us one substitute in every building every day of the week. And we think that would maybe draw some more candidates versus someone who, versus what we currently do, which is someone's out today, let's try to get a sub. So at least we're guaranteed one, we would be guaranteed one sub in the buildings, which would help us out. And again, that's for a year and a half to try to help 
during these quarantines and, and, and this COVID, you know, COVID issues. We already talked about the stipends for lunch. This was back, I forget if it was July or August when, when Joe mentioned this. The extra lunch periods require extra stipends. And we mentioned back then that we were gonna put them in the ARP grant. We just did it for the next, we did it for the next two years to make sure that it's needed for next year we're covered as well. Again, the bolded items are kind of our wish list of one-time costs that would not affect future budget years, but things that are absolutely really needed. One is probably the highest priority on there is probably that phone system. Uh, our phone system is without saying, without saying, but being very blunt, it's, it's, it's old. I mean, it, it's just, it's antiquated. Uh, when you call out, it takes a good five to 10 seconds for it to actually call. So we would like to go to a, a VOIP type system, which is what most districts would have at this time. Uh, Chromebooks, obviously one-on-one -on -one initiative, plus you know, virtual learning is, never, is not going away in terms of people being quarantined, things of that nature. So just making sure our Chromebook are up, up to par and constantly being replaced. Display panels, we have about eight more to replace. Uh, so that would be nice to get that done. And two copiers, um, are probably older than my professional career. So they're pretty old. They need to be replaced. And I would like to, rather than do a lease, again, if this was an option, rather than do a lease, we just buy the copiers. That way future budget years would actually have see a savings because they would be our machines versus leasing the machines. So that's one option. Some of the facility items that we were talking about is just constantly looking at HVAC, HVAC upgrades. We would like to replace a couple of unit ventilators, maybe purchasing air purifiers. These are all items that I think we would all say these are needed. These are things that we would like to do. But again, we're going to wait till next December till I can tell you that our budget looks solid for 23, 24. At least I can predict at least a little bit better. So there, there, there are the initial ideas there. And just so you know, that is the, there's different parts of this grant. That was this overarching clump of $640,000. There's also subparts of the grant that are other additional amounts of money. So for example, if you look back at that slide, you'll notice I didn't mention the counselor at all. It's not because we were cutting the counselor. It's actually because there's a separate item here like mental health support staffing grant that we're hoping to potentially increase that part-time counselor that's currently being supplied by the ESSER two funds. Our goal is to try to, to increase the hours, potentially even the full time, for the next two years. There's also beyond. There's also a grant for beyond the school day activities, so we'll offer enrichment activities for the 20, 22, 23, and 23, 24. Since the ESSER two funds already have funds allocated for, um, I believe for this year, and same thing for the summer learning and enrichment. Same thing. Uh, same thing. Um, and then obviously the accelerated learning coaching and educator support grant was more for professional development. So we'll develop a professional development plan to spend those funds over a two year period. So again, these grants go through 23, 24, which is important to understand. So it's not like we have, we have all this money just for now, we can use it for future years, um, which is what we're trying to do with this. So Harry, if you wanna go back. Um, yeah, I, here, here are my questions, Steve. The um, how many basic skills teachers are we talking about? It's one full time person, but over probably about a year and a half. Okay, so this is for a year and a half. This year, uh, part of this year. Got you. Yep. Okay, okay, that that makes sense because the salary <laughs> didn't seem quite right, and the provide ground support, but that they're not going. We're not contracting out to get someone to cut the grass for us are we that's what we're going to try to do for a year and a half versus versus potentially i think somewhere. the i think the township needs to be approached about cutting the grass i mean if we're going to pay pay them thirty seven thousand dollars to cut oh, our we grass. can do that we, we can we can we can we can reach out to them for service. That's not a maybe hey bob maybe you know, any <laughs> anyone still on the council about? Gladly resign my position on the board for a contract cutting the school's grass. Yeah, I know that's problematic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I don't think we can. 
I don't think we can afford to have some, you know, that I thought it was there with the idea that that's for the cleaning, for the utilize that, that it was showing up as grounds contract, but it was showing up to be in the extra custodian, you know, what we're talking about for the cleaning purposes, et cetera, that helped disinfect for a year and a half. That I thought that, so are we talking about one person for the extra custodian and then a contract okay. on top of that? Yes, yes, yes. Part-time custodian. To help yeah, I, I, personally, I don't, I don't think we can afford that grounds contract. And I saw what was being done. I mean, it was, uh, you know, what we were asking one person to do as far as cutting grass was, you know, it'd be fine if that was his only job, but, um, you know, it, it, it does need to be addressed, but I don't think this is a problem of throwing uh, money out or just a contract if someone addresses it, unless <laughs> camera, no, I'm teasing, I'm teasing. So, uh, <laughs> the, uh, well, Harry, Harry, just it, to I, respond to that for a moment. Yeah. The reason that that was put in there was because Tim Allen, who okay. is, uh, like like Stephen was saying, he um, he's basically being the Swiss Army knife of facilities in that he's doing all sorts of work, and and Tim's team is doing all sorts of different tasks as well. We know that they're working hard, they're working every day, and at the same time, uh, Tim lost a maintenance person last year due to the rift. So Tim has taken on those responsibilities himself. So we just feel that it makes a lot of sense to give Tim the opportunity to do other things. So Stephen mentioned HVAC. That right there could be a full-time job in itself. And yet that's what Tim is also doing. And then he's also doing the grass and he's also doing any other maintenance. And that, that was, that we feel like we have uh, one of our really great, hardworking, excellent people just completely overloaded right now. And it's, it's important for us to address that. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I understand that. That's, you know, I've seen, I mean, I've literally seen him going like, it looks like 30 miles an hour on, you know, at, on, uh, it was in the late spring at uh, Walnut in the back there. And I didn't, you know, and then, you know, it's, it, it, we need that services done, but I think we need to figure out a uh, a less expensive way to do that. And I, I really think that we should approach the, uh, you know, they have, we pay taxes for, I mean, I see them at parks. I see them at the, you know, doing stuff around town. I mean, that's stuff around town, cutting the grass at the uh, schoolyards. That's that's my suggestion. No, I think um, it's your suggestion is and the, 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 for shared the, service. I have, no, I have no problem doing that, reaching out to them for a shared service to see if they'll be open to it. Yeah. I still think it's, and if that's a cheaper option, it's a cheaper option, but I still think if you expect your, it's very difficult to expect your director of facilities, and especially in this day and age with COVID, and, and he's spending two days out just, just cutting grass at least. Um, when you, yeah, when, but you know, I understand, and I understand as you know, practical of having to have the grass cut. But at the same time, I think I'd like to see the money put into education directly. That's my bias. I um, have to. I'll second that. Building that. substitute. That's a good idea. Thank you, Vera. Yeah, I'll the, second um, that because the we have. I was just going to say we have um, our last district goals. What did we have as on reading level? What, what was it? Forty-seven percent of the kids. Is that right? Am I remembering that correctly? I was trying to get. It, to it that. was. So we're not was currently around. discussing the goals, Vera. But okay. But the reason I mentioned that is that uh, I agree with Harry that we got to squeeze more money into getting reading levels up we got to get tutoring in we um we we need to do more small group i mean we just had the strong assessments in hamilton and you have a whole range of of um different ranges of learning loss so you need to do a lot of small group work 
I mean, we got to put us, some of that money into education, into tutoring. Those those uh, subs that we we call those floating subs in my district that um. I, I could agree with those building substitutes if they were put, I mean, they got to be put to use if no substitutes are required on a certain day, then those substitutes can be pulled to work with kids. Is that the plan? I mean, they're, they're, yeah, absolutely. They're, 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 they're Definitely. Armed. Definitely. And, you know, we have an absence report every day that we receive and we review. And, you know, I can, I can safely say that on any given day of the school year, there is a high likelihood that we'll have a staff member absent. So it's it's important for us to have those subs. But just going back to the grounds and anything related to facilities, you know, I mentioned Tim Allen, but the entire facilities team, I keep describing them as, I mean, they are they're the heroes of what we're doing when it comes to cleaning and sanitizing and making sure that the buildings are safe and healthy for everyone. They're doing an amazing job with that. And at the same time, they are overworked and understaffed. You know, we, we, we simply don't have the people to keep up with all the needs sometimes. And because of that, that's why Steve is incorporating these items because Tim and his just desperately need this support. Well, the, the, the work has to be done, but I, you know, when I, when I look at it and I say, well, wait a minute, I can get a, an extra custodian for forty five thousand, and uh, you know, for a year and a half, and it's not. I mean, that's a full time person, is it not, to help disinfect no. for a year and a half? No, it's not. It's a part time person. With, with, a full time custodian would be forty five plus benefits plus FICA, Medicare, hers. I mean, a full time custodian. You're talking eighty five ninety for one year. Okay, and so seven. So together, if I add the extra custodian in the grounds contract and have the extra custodian in charge of cutting the grass, I mean, that is what I'm looking at is how to accomplish the work that has to get done. And if it's for a year, a year and a half, um, I mean, when you say if to help disinfect, what and part time, what kind of part time are we talking about? Because it's the same. I mean, it's it'd be the same thing as hiring someone to, to do the grounds. They have to. They're not going to. They're just going to be responsible for doing it. They're not going to have if they can do it in a day or less. For the am I correct? And the same thing with the disinfecting. Is that a just certain times of the day no, I, no, no. i'm just trying i can't we disinfect it every night each okay. building is infected every so the night. person would be there and disinfect are two different things so yeah. that's a yeah i understand and i understood when you yeah. distinguish them but i mean we're talking about an extra custodian or is that a part-time custodian part-time custodian Okay, and when we say that, so what are we doing? You can't, it can't be less, less than 29 hours or? Yes, yes. Okay. So if we had two part-time custodians and one did the, disin or they both shared disinfecting and grounds. I'm just trying to figure out how to make our money go as far as we can with it and i mean i like the idea of the building substitute and along with what beer is saying you know if you can get a good and same thing with basic skills kind of background um they're 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 great if you haven't that that's another person consistent person in in both buildings and um that i the the one you know okay the basic skill i'm still like it seems like for for basic skills teachers we we don't have any now they how many basic skills teachers do we have yeah we do have a skills teacher but uh similar to tim allen that teacher is a swiss army knife teacher 
and is taking on multiple duties, including basic skills. That's why having uh, a person dedicated to basic skills only would be essential for us. And I don't know, I just, it just seems that, I, I'm just trying to do the math in my head of 130 over a year and a half, what that breaks down to. Uh, and then the, um, the highlighted bolded items, um, continue to upgrade is that at both schools and i think we have to look long and hard at um what walnut street school what kind of future it it has because of some of the structural problems it might have in the hvac and we've you know we have that other that air conditioning unit sitting over there it, would that you know how much is that going to help? I mean, uh, that's an old building. It's a very old building and it has, you know, some of those problems that old buildings do. So maybe that ties into what we were talking about earlier about projected, you know, funding or what we were going to have to do as a, not just a school board, but as a community, as a town with um, the schools going forward. Uh, Stephen, yeah, I um, mean, I, I really go, go ahead, Vera. No, I wanted to get more information on the phone system because I want to research that. What is what is the um, the harm of not moving on the phone system? And that's why we were saying we would wait. It's something that really needs to be done. Like I said, there are, there's a big delay in it. It's not something I have to get this ready. I don't understand what you mean by delay. So if I call into the school, no one's going to immediately pick up. Or you mean like when I, if I called you, it, it, would, it takes five or 10 seconds to actually dial you. There's, there's a massive delay. It's, it's not, it's not like quick. you punch in the oh, number oh, and it doesn't oh, start oh, ringing for like oh, five seconds. Even, even, even longer. Uh, 911, same thing. Like it's so. This the system the system's outdated. Uh, so most what is the name of that system? Like you were saying, you wanted a, v a VOIP voice over voice over internet protocol. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. And what we have now, what is that called? I have it written down. Um, I can email it to you. I have it written down in my office. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's um, I wrote it down for this exact reason actually, but not being in the office, I, I know you know I did, did bring. It. Hold on one second. It might be analog. Just analog. That's the catch-all phrase for the old stuff. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll just research right, wait, this no, other no, stuff. No. Yes, yeah, analog. And what it does, and the reason why there's a delay, so I, this is why I wrote it down. There's an analog and it converts to a, di basically it takes it and converts to digital. And that's what causes things to be so slow in how it operates. Um, and the other idea was if, we, if you move the phone lines to you know, the VOIP, you'd also be able to move to the cloud. Uh, so everything would be backed up by the cloud in terms of the phone system as well. Steve, you'd also save right now you're worth paying for uh, POTS lines. Yep, yeah, absolutely right. We have so to that, those up. costs go away with the uh, with the voice over IP. Yes, yeah, so we, we keep one for each building just in case, you know, the whole right. but yeah, you usually the old buildings, especially pure uh, Walnut, you usually I remember in Haddonfield, we had I couldn't tell you how many POTS lines and no one knew what they did. And uh, we were able to cut off pretty much all of them except for one. And you save, like you said, it saves, it saves money per month on the operating yes. budget. Right. Yes. It saves money down the road, but it's a big cost up front. And I would prefer that money go to education now, which we're in an emergency situation with all of those months being online. And a lot of children cannot learn as well. There's, they are, the, the kids in Delanco were already starting with um, not the best reading level. Now we add on COVID, 
we got to go full force into education and delay some of this other stuff. That's how I feel. That's why well, it, the bold that's, that's why it's bolded. It's not going to be purchased until December 2022. So that's why that's I that's, said put it off even further than that. Yeah, but we don't have to deal with that now. It's just numbers right now that we're looking at that's in the budget. Okay, well, I'm just that, giving my opinion. Put it off even longer. Yeah, than I know, but that. Yeah, but um, so many changes will be done before then that it's not worth addressing. So we know that's a need going forward. And, you know, we're not going to, we're pushing it down the road because of what you're saying, Vera. I think everyone agrees with that, that the money, and the same thing I, where the mental health support staffing, is there ways that we can get more funding into that and more service? This is from um, where we're getting all of our special ed services for people um, if we need it for, like Vera was saying, you know, sometimes group, um, you know, that, that a counselor can do group stuff with kids, not just individual, depending on what we need. I don't know what the needs are. Harry, we, we wouldn't be able to put more money into that subgrant. That's what we're being given. Okay, that's allocated. Okay, wait, yeah. I have... Yeah, I wrote, I, I took a little note card because I saw that was, that some of it, the 40,000 and the 40,000. Are we no, doing the, any after school were, tutoring? Any after school tutoring at all? Yes, uh, based on ESSER two funds, uh, we are going to be starting up an after school uh, program for English language arts, as well as STEM. That's what the ESSER two funds were designed for, uh, spe specifically for programs like that uh, related to learning loss. Now under ESSER two, they didn't call it learning loss. Uh, they were calling it uh, academic acceleration, but uh, it's, uh, my opinion of it is we're not really gonna be accelerating, we're going to be addressing learning loss. So how many hours of uh, tutoring after school does that look like? Over what time period? Like three hours a week or? I, I could share the ESSER 2 plan with the full board at another time. I, I, I would really prefer not to get in the weeds on every little aspect. Can of you do like a very general, like two times a week for two months, like a very general overview? Uh, it, it could be that. I, I, I'm not prepared to discuss that program right now. Okay, but maybe next meeting? Uh, I can share it with the board, as I said. Okay, thank you. And I also want to comment, we have these funds as well that will be used for those kind of programs as well. That subgrant, the is, I don't know, I thought that that was a, as opposed to the 40K, that that was, you know, that was it. That all, you know, that was like the maximum that districts got or certain size districts got. I but so. I thought that the um, accelerated learning coaching, was that also capped? As well as that 88. Received a certain amount of funds. 501 for this, mental this health. ESSER 2 was already discussed and approved by the board months ago. So I, I, like I said, I'm not really prepared to discuss okay. these programs right now, but I can share that, reshare yeah, that. No, 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 that's fine. I just... Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I like I said because I made my note of breaking that out, the ARP and the S, you know, and trying to find out, you know, there was the the sub grant, there was the, you know, the total of eight hundred and sixty one thousand four sixty two, but that will go away after what year and a half. Yeah. Yeah. A year and a half, two years. Yeah. Can, can you hear me? Yes, Harry. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the grant goes to 23, 24. So that's why we budget funds over multiple years. Okay. No, that's fine. I'm just trying to get a bigger picture. And like I say, I can see the mentality behind it. So thanks for that. Um, and it is. It's a combination of going backwards, forward, and projecting and... 
you know, leaving enough that you can move around if need be, if there's emergencies. And it looks like you've, you've covered it in two or three ways. So thanks for that work. That, those are my questions with, with so the- For the uh, counselor, are you saying that there would be, because on, on this screen that you're showing right now, it says increase part-time counselor hours for the next couple of years. On the previous slide, you have um, option pl places two counselors into the operating budget. Well, then that was not two. In ESSER 2. Oh, option two. Okay, I, miss, yeah. I misread that. Okay. So yeah. are you saying, though, that there would be, like, we're using both of those funds together to get a full-time counselor? Like, what exactly? Basically, again, I put the facility, when I mentioned the facility budget going in the operating budget, mm -hmm. I included a counselor. So I, I try to take the cost that we want to project the 23-24. Because I, like, I would like to know what those costs are and how we can do it, especially given our fund balance situation for next year. I put the facility person and the counselor in the operating budget for next year, part-time, part-time. So the idea is to use these additional funds and the ESSER two to try to make sure we can get a, make that part-time as close to full-time, if not full-time for the next two years. Gotcha. And then um, after that, we'll have to see, but uh, like I said, I'm trying to put as much into the budget because I want to try, my, my biggest thing is sustainability. If, it's, if the counselor is not in the budget, what happens in two years? Right, and I guess that's my question too about the facilities personnel. Um, so that is your plan as well. Like we had to, you know, riff somebody. Um, yeah, I mean, the extra custodian is seen exactly as that. It's an extra one that we would obviously not have after one and a half years. That's why it's hopefully COVID is not not an issue, and that's why we were trying to go with the grounds contract because we don't want to have to rip rip people in a year and a half. The idea is to hire somebody to help out during COVID, and hopefully, if this alleviates a little bit in a year and a half, maybe we'll be in a different situation. And we can right, but you have the facility personnel. Yes, the, the, the personnel that's in the personnel that was in our budget and partially placed into the ESSER two is fully in the budget. Okay. Yes. Um. Question. Uh, I'm not a fan of grass, so I'm just going to start by saying that. Seems like a waste of money to me. Um, is there any way instead to put money towards landscaping that is more sustainable in the future so we don't have to constantly be hiring people to mow the lawn that most of which is not used? There's a lot of property. I think that would cost significant dollars. Well, you can have, you know, you can have grass that is sustainable grass that you don't need to mow every year. It's roughly times. nine and a half acres. What is that? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I did a quick measurement while I was sitting here uh, listening to your presentation, Steve. It's roughly nine and a half acres, give or take some abnormalities. Wow. That's pretty impressive. Huh. I mean, for a yearly contract, it's not a terrible price, but. I like, I like Kat's point about research grass. I mean, I'm sure they have that. There's varieties that, you know, that maybe you don't need to mow as often or whatever. And on that note, I just want to say Tim Allen, he, he's cutting the grass right across from my house. Man, he did a great job. I never saw that field look so good. Anyway, keep going. Anyway, I just like, like longer term, it doesn't make sense to me to hire somebody to cut grass. You know, you know what I mean? <laughs> we will, well, it's, from a personal it's not a long term. Well, I am a, I'm a, sorry, Steve. I'm somebody who doesn't like spending money on grass. Um, <laughs> but like you said, I mean, golf courses take a lot of money to keep up right. and, uh, you know, I, I completely agree with that from, from, a, from a personal standpoint, I think replanting all the grass, like, cause you'd have to get rid of the grass in order to, to do that. I would assume. Um, well, you would, you would just uh, like seed over, you could cut it down really low seed over with grass. That's meant to be taller that you just, you know, cut down once or twice a year virtual grass. I like this idea. Let's, let's go more into this. Yeah, I don't know. Not, we're talking nine and a half acres of reseeding now, but either way, I feel like we're uh, literally, we're getting just on this. Um, so. Let me throw this out. If, if we were going to consider different kinds of grass, the, the way to go would probably be to start small. You pick, you know, half an acre mm -hmm. and start there and then troubleshoot the process and, and see if it's appropriate to scale up. I, I, I appreciate the idea. However, the, this money is limited 
to only the next year and a half. And that's why this idea was being put forth. Because as I mentioned, Tim Allen is pushing himself beyond the limit to get all of this work done as one person. Now we're Mowing nine and a half acres is insane. You should see how, how many fast months he years. goes. Oh my God, he goes so fast on that thing. Well, that, that's what I, I mean, though. We're, we're we're losing Tim to that task rather than having him focus on other right. things. That is that needs to me is a big deal. So I want you to imagine that I'm on the mower out there two days a week. And <laughs> say, why is our superintendent doing that? And I'm going to say, well, I'm the only person who can do it. And and that's the case right now with Tim. That's that's really not the best use of our, dist our director of facilities when he has many other tasks on his plate as well. That's that's the whole point of this. Mm -hmm. He needs for, time to do other things as well. Grass doesn't need to be mown in the winter time. No, um, it's not is, So lot, is this for, intensive then. is this contract, the grounds contract for the growing season? Which we, is, we would probably, I mean, we would solicit quotes, things of that nature. And um, yeah, it, it would it would be there's different ways of doing the contract. We haven't we haven't gotten the quotes yet. This is not idea of pricing. It may be high. We may be a high price, and we can reallocate it. But okay. what you do is, for example, some places would bill per week or per cut. Sorry, per cut. Others would bill like they would say we would want to do it twice a week, and there's how much. You know. So it depends on what they would do. But we would have to bring people out and actually get their ideas of how they would want to do it and see the cost. But no, I agree with you. Certain times of year has to be cut more or less. For example, early spring and fall is cut more than the dead of summer when the heat is beating on it. And the winter, obviously. Yeah. I estimated roughly 26 to 30 weeks of cutting weather, give or take. Yeah. You're our so, resident, resident grass expert. I love it. Yeah, so basically it's like uh, one year. Yeah, 52 weeks in a year. Right. Um, well, part, pardon the pun, but our board is in the weeds on this um, when it comes to this topic. I, I feel like what we need, and this is my recommendation as a superintendent, you know, we have a business administrator who has a long view in mind when it comes to our budget. He also looks at the short term, and Steve's done a fantastic job with this. We also have a director of facilities who's been involved in part of this uh, discussion. And we were the ones advocating for him to have more time to do other things versus the grass cutting. Um, so no matter what, I just I think it's important for the board to consider that when we have great people working really hard on things, I don't want them to be overloaded with tasks that we could potentially have other people do by adding either additional staff or outsourcing that service. And again, this is this this I, I agree with Vera. We absolutely need to focus on learning instruction, academic achievement, and everything related to that. But at the same time, uh, the nuts and bolts of our district uh, definitely need some support as well. Remember the association also was, was involved in this and supported this idea, um, supported these ideas as well. I so we need Dana to decide Mater with her hand up. Can she make a comment, Dana Mater, or no? Um, no, it's not a public comment. Correct. Correct. When do we need to decide this? This is the reason why I wanted to bring this up today. And again, this is still a draft and draft form because mm -hmm. the grants due, I think, November 15th. So in November, the first meeting in November, we're gonna have, probably have to approve this so we can submit it. So I didn't want to I didn't want to bring this up on November, whatever that date is. Um, mm -hmm. because I, I didn't want to have the first conversation then. I wanted to at least bring up what people have been discussing in our district on this today so that on November, they'd be right, you know, you know, we'd be ready to go. So okay. So we have some time to think about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if there, I, I mean, I, I agree with uh, Mr. Mersinger that you know, as much as possible, and Vera, as much as and Harry, as as many of the people have said that we need to figure out a way to, you know, make education the focus here. We, you know, rift several teachers. And to me, um, a priority is making sure that not necessarily, you know, whatever it needs to be done to make sure that the kids are supported because we already know that they started out uh, a tough year in a tough spot. Things have gotten worse. 
Um, I hear a lot of rumblings about bullying problems at the school, uh, behavioral issues. So I just wanna make sure that all of those things are the top priority before grasses or something like that. So that's my opinion on it. Could we- uh, Reminder, we have this slide as well. All these funds will be used for right. a lot of those purposes as well. Right. So it's this slide is like the main slide that's the bulk of the money, but there's also the summer learning programs and the beyond the school day activities, which is in addition to the SO2 funds, which are also being, which also will be expended uh, for, for example, after school tutoring, as Mr. Merson had mentioned. I like everything you've said so far, Steve. Yeah. I think we can probably move on to something else now because that's, you know, just things that we're talking about, not actual, to you know, uh, written in yeah. granny yet. Is that correct? Exactly. I mean, there's still, right. there's still more ways to, to do it, um, but uh, we're, we're trying to finalize things for November. Yeah, working. we're working toward finalizing them is where we are in this process. And we had that, you know, the budget, you know, that I had suggested that everyone, you know, that we all have uh, how to build a budget and the time sequences. But I think it also might be worth reaching out to BCIT because they have apprenticeship programs and we might be able to get someone in their black seal, could even be someone from, you know, Delanco Riverside, who knows where, that is a student that can work as an apprentice that we apprentice and pay at the same time we get the services we need, but not at $37,000 for grass cutting. That's an excellent idea, Harry. Yeah, well, I, I, I had apprenticed a young man from there in West Hampton who, who I saw him five years later, he was the head of maintenance there. And that's the Black Seal program they're doing the, uh, to be a maintenance mechanic. To, they, they need that certification. So it helps both. It's, you know, you earn while you learn and it makes a full cycle back if we, the same thing, if we happen to hit a kid from, uh, you know, from Delanco or Riverside or nearby that, so that's a school to work office at BCIT that could be contacted about that. Okay, that's definitely a good idea. And I think it's something that when they're looking to put this more together and have more discussions about it, that it can definitely be an option so that it's not necessarily a grounds contract, or maybe it's a contract for an apprenticeship that will enable Tim to have a little bit more time to do what he needs to do because he has somebody that can work with him as an apprentice in that position. Well, yeah, that's, that's how it works. Yeah. I mean, the young man, I had a print from that shop. I apprenticed not only that young man, but he's now the, the police chief in Burlington city. That's he took that apprentice and that's where he ended up his career path. And someone who his stu his son went here, uh, Mr. Snow, um, same thing. He came out of that same shop and he's done well. So it's giving, so, uh, it's, it's a giving back to, but I, you know, I don't want to get us off on, but I think it's something to look into. So Marissa, if, if the you, is interested in that, I can certainly reach out to BCIT about that topic. Let's do that. So that way we can explore that and then we can either yeah. introduce it into a discussion or we can say that it's just not a possibility one way or another. So it doesn't have to keep revisiting. Cool. All right. Yeah. Um, great. Thank you. That's a really great uh, piece of advice. And Stephen, thank you so much for this presentation. It certainly was thought provoking and it certainly gives us something to, to look at and more information to understand as well as to how money is going to be allocated from this, um, from the grants that we're receiving, the SRO funds, the ARP grant. Thank you. No problem. Okay. We're going to move this forward. Um, once Steve stops sharing, then we'll move this forward to the draft agenda for October 20th, 2021, Exhibit C. So, okay, awesome. Thank you. 
And obviously we have items one through five. Those are the normal items on an agenda. Does anybody have any discussions related to the approval of minutes of the September 8th, 2021 regular meeting? September 15th, 2021 regular meeting exhibit D. Okay, nobody has anything. That's good to know. Um, does anybody have anything to know in regards to the acceptance of the reports of the board secretary and treasurer for August 2021, which are in agreement with which are exhibit E? Thank you. Does anybody have anything specific to note in regards to the liaison reports that may be brought up during the meeting next week? Cool. Student recognition and obviously the visitors um, welcome are things that I'm will address next week, not something that we can discuss it this week unless Mr. S Mr. Mersinger has something to address specifically just, about student recognition. Yeah, I just wanted to share one thing, just that the principals are acknowledging students in the schools, just like we mentioned, uh, they're receiving certificates, pencils, and, and or other items to acknowledge the fact that they're students of the month. And we're gonna continue to read their names during the board meeting. Uh, parents and the students are invited to attend the, the virtual board meeting to be part of that. But at the same time, uh, it is important for the board to be aware that students are being recognized during the school day as well. Awesome. Okay, and then there's the public comment on agenda items specific to this agenda. Um, and then we have, uh, well, I see two hands. Would this be a time, even though it's the workshop discussing the draft agenda to bring that up, or should I just wait until the end, Amy, for the public comment on non-agenda items? Because it's kind of like a duplication here. Sure. I'm well, we're not, um, you're reviewing the October 20th agenda. You're not actually doing the October 20th public comment. So I would follow our agenda and um, I would follow our agenda for today. Mm -hmm. And forgive me, I'm trying to pull it back up. That's okay. So to wait until public comment on non-agenda items at that point in time. Yes. Have we, and I joined five minutes late because my internet connection or my laptop had actually crashed. So I'm not sure, did I miss the first public comments already? Yes. Yes. Okay, so then you already mm -hmm. Pardon me? You missed your raise. <laughs> you your raise when you were off. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know. But no, but no, that's perfect. I just wanted to make sure that I was doing it the right way and I wasn't. No, you're, you're, you're doing it. You're doing it the right way. We're at, we're following, the meeting actually follows um, today's October 13th agenda. You're just reviewing another document as part of that. Perfect. That sounds great. I appreciate it. Okay, moving forward, does anybody- Wait, I, I didn't understand. You're saying that you're not taking public comment at this time. I'm not, I missed that. Correct. So, yeah. so even though this, this meeting is specifically for discussion, it's a, dis, it's a meeting, it's a working meeting. You're not gonna take any discussion from the public? Well, we opened it up no. at the beginning of the meeting where I asked for public comment on agenda items and nothing was, no, nobody spoke. So I closed it at the okay. end after we just, yeah. So after, at the end, after I discussed, we discussed this, then I'll open it back up again, just like we follow this agenda here over. Oh, well, okay. Okay. It's just the procedure. Right here. Okay. I got yeah. you. I got you. All right, cool. Does anybody have um, anything to discuss in regards to the superintendent's report that Mr. Mersinger has put out with, that includes exhibit F, exhibit G, exhibit H, exhibit I, and the um, additional information after that. Okay, it's the J, K, L, M, and N, and O as well. Sorry about that, I didn't see all that. Um, okay. Oh, I Does do, it, I do. Okay. We, we're doing now G, letter G. Sure, what did you have a question okay. on? Okay, so um, I looked at everything like two days ago and I'll, the, the stuff in yellow, the highlighted stuff, a lot of it wasn't, hadn't been put on yet. So has ever, you know, I'm not sure has, have all of these things been put on since then? Cause I only glass, glanced at it quickly before the meeting. Yes, they're all did, in the packet. Okay, so I did look at L, a virtual instruction plan. I thought that I just want to comment that um, it's going, if, if 
We have to go to virtual instruction because you always have to plan for that. I'm glad to see that it's, it's a full day. It's a full school day. So people need to be aware of that. Um, mentoring plan, is that only for the new, like uh, student teachers and new teachers? Is that what that refers to? It's for newly hired teachers who do not yet have their standard certificate or other staff members. So right now, now, technically it impacts one teacher, but we do have other teachers that are uh, working on acquiring their certificates, uh, earning their certificates. So uh, that plan does impact one person officially right now, but could impact a couple more people in the coming months. Okay. And what I really wanted to comment more on was letter H district goals. It seems like we're basically still using the um, Fontis and Pinnell system, which is the letter the uh, reading level by letters, um, which is in RAS Kids, the RAS Kids program. And um, we did that last year. And uh, I, I'm wondering how parents are informed about this. Are they, are they uniformly given as um, your directive as superintendent? Do you have the teachers inform the parents, okay, your child is starting at letter M, which is really proficiency should be at letter Q. So they're not proficient. They're not at where they should be, but our goal is to get them. Like, are you informing parents throughout the year? Teachers uh, do inform parents of the student's progress throughout the year, as well as, uh, you know, we have parent-teacher conferences that happen twice a year. As, as the board is aware, we have evening conferences being added this year. So not only is there communication to parents, but there are also meetings with parents for the opportunity to learn about how their child is doing. Yes. Okay, so since we're using this as our, you know, the Fontes and Pinnell for our district goals, do you direct teachers specifically to inform the parents your child is at this level, which is either below, at, or above, do you specifically um, direct the teachers? Because I think that should be very important for parents to know. Like they shouldn't know in June, oh, my kid is really far behind and he's not reading at, he's not where he should be. His proficiency level is not where it should be. They got to they gotta be on that path as soon as possible to know um, what they're shooting for. And the Your question is, do, do teachers share info with parents? The answer is yes. If Not just info, is, but Do the I directly letter. tell teachers, do this this way? The answer is no. Well, I think you should because that's th this letter system that Fontes and Pinnell has is, is easy to understand. If you know that letter is indicative of, of being proficient for that grade level. So I would, what is wrong with directing teachers? teachers to let parents know very specifically in the beginning of the year at every parent teacher conference and report cards what the proficiency level of their child is to answer because your question, I, I i never I, i've never indicated there's anything wrong with it so you do, do my that. guess is it's quite possible that the teacher no, no miss darmo i said that i do not specifically direct teachers to inform parents that way but i'm also saying there's nothing wrong with it well, I would like I, I would like to ask the board if they would support me in asking Mr. Mersinger to specifically direct all teachers to do that. I, am I asking that in the right way? Because I'm asking the whole board. Am I doing that I right? Say, I, say, I say no. Let Mr. Mersinger do yeah. his job. It's not your job. No, right. It's not our job to. You're micromanaging. This is about informing. That's micromanaging. On proficiency you're, the how level. you're. You're trying to tell yeah, but, uh, administration how to parents do parents on proficiency level in a very clear way is is uh you know I think that's part of my oversight. Why do you assume I that it isn't being sure, done? I want to make sure. Well, he said he doesn't direct all teachers right. to do that. Hey, Vera, I, have, I have a thought. Maybe we can look for some research because there there might be evidence out there that informing parents of that information is helpful. I just Maybe feel like it's, it's not helpful. But, but Steve, Steve, for, for say that I must now <laughs> direct teachers to inform parents of information about their children. This is already happening. The, mm -hmm. the parent, first of all, the teachers are, we have interim reports. We have report cards. 
We have a Genesis grade book. We have parent teacher conferences. So I'm not, I'm not saying that teachers aren't ever directed to inform parents, but this very specific question from Vera is the answer is no. I have not said to teachers, you must inform parents uh, the, the reading levels and, and all that in a specific way that that has not occurred, no. Yeah, my point was simply that if, if we were gonna propose a change like that, it would be good to have evidence part, going on our guts. The whole uh, reason the school yeah. report card at a state level came about, the school report card at a state level and all this state testing came about is because parents wanted to be informed. And my feeling is, you know, really that Fontas and Pinnell, it's a better reflection of their reading level than these state tests, because I just went through the start strong in my district and the kids were like, I wanna just get through this. It was not a good reflection of their real ability. That's why I'm, I think this is a plus for our district because Fontas and Pinnell would be a better reflection than say the NJSLA. Well, I, I'm, my thought is, is that when parents go to these parent conferences and the discussion is, you know, opened up and the parents like, how is my kid doing? That then becomes the opportunity for whomever's having that conversation to mention whether or not their, their child is struggling in one area or another and probably gives information like they should be here, they're here. And, you know, we're hoping that we can get them to this next stage. You know, I, that's my guess that these people that, you know, individuals who come to conferences most likely ask. I'm sure that you've asked that about your own child when she was in school. I know I personally have asked that as a parent. When I go into these parent conferences, I'm asking, how is my child doing? Where are they, where are their strengths? Where are their weaknesses? And then in turn, the educator then provides me with that input. What I found as a when I was in the middle school, and now I'm all in elementary, is in middle school, um, we had a lot of grade inflation, um, you know, parents didn't, okay, I'm not, I don't want to say anything bad about teachers, but if you have a very, uh, that's why we got this state testing started. So there would be something very objective that the parents could look at. And I think Fontes and Pinnell is, could also be a better objective measure, but I've said my part you know, I don't have support for this, so I'm just going to leave it there. But, um, I have a question. About, so just so you understand, you do have support for this. I believe teachers should inform parents of these things. Your specific question about me issuing a directive to teachers saying, here's what you should inform parents of and here's how you should inform them. We have interim reports. We have report cards. We have parent-teacher conferences. And out of respect for the professionals, the college-educated certified professionals that we have on our team, I choose not to micromanage that. So if my administrative team and I were to look and say, well, we see this as a significant issue, we would talk with teachers about it and say, well, are parents not aware of this? What's happening with parents? I, I just feel like your question is coming out of a place of not really being part of those discussions. And I'm just well, not- The reason I'm saying it is because the reading level is so low based on our data from last year and before COVID that, that my fear is that parents don't realize how critical it is that students are reading on grade level by grade three. This is, this is evidence, an evidence-based statement. By grade three, after that most most education is done through book learning, not just discussion. You have to be reading a lot. You have to have a, a academic vocabulary, which is different from conversational vocabulary. I just feel like if parents knew how critical it was, I'm hoping that that would spur them to be more involved. And I think for one example of how this could be done in a less heavy handed way, is on a report card or an interim report, just have a little section for putting that Fontes and Pinnell letter in there and also saying what the proficiency score should, what is expected at that time frame in the year. That's what I would do. I would maybe address that in a standard interim report. 
on interim reports, these things are addressed, not by specific letters, but if a child is at level, below level, or, or exceeding, it is addressed. So I think that what you're saying is supported, just may not be supported exactly how you want it to be. But I do believe that it is supported and it is carried out. Yes. And in fact, our report card is a standard space report card, If we, uh, specifically speaking about Pearson. And that standard space report card has a number of key elements related to reading. And then the student has a, a rating in that element of exceeding, meeting, uh, progressing, or an area of concern. So that is different, Vera, from what you're saying about the Fountas and Canal leveling. Absolutely. But it's still in, important information for parents. Uh, this does not mean that, that teachers don't ever share that information, though. And I, I, just, I just want us to be careful that you know, we have teachers that are working hard, they're doing a great job, they're communicating with families. I don't want us to make assumptions that they're not doing these things. And, I, and nor do I want us to make assumptions that they need to be directed and micromanaged in regard to what is pretty basic communication with a parent related to literacy. I'm just trying to find a way to help the reading level. And I think we have to do maybe something that we haven't done before. So I'll, I'll let this move on. Well, I, I have a, you know, since we're talking about this, which is fine, it's kind of off the agenda and the path, et cetera. But what Vera said about the K to three, I would think, you know, it, it's, it is valid information that that's where you want to have kids at their grade level by third grade with reading and math so that it would be helpful if we put some of this money that's going into helping kids and the extra money that we're only going to have for a short while to make sure we're pumping in at that level so that we maybe can break the structural chain and also to find those kids that are not meeting success by that time to get them the extra help, that it's a sequential learning process, but putting the emphasis on, yeah, the pre-K, the K to three to make sure. And then at that point, you know, you want to be alert that, okay, this child is at grade level, this child's above grade level, and this child's below grade level, and that our system, from what I um understand it to be is that we do do that that the you know that um it's it is being done and the things that you know you you were talking about vera is you know if you were the superintendent that would be your job to do you know whoever that would be their preference and that's what and this has come over a, a number of years that it's developed to be at this point. And basically I, the way I saw it, we were finally at a point where we saw right where we were, which was using that information. And then the whole system, you know, went kaput because of COVID and, you know, standardized tests now, what do they mean, you know, and what, what good are they um, for an individual child? They need the help, they need the, um, adult resources that we can bring and any extra as soon as possible. So, and I think the pre pre K will also help with that. So, right. No, it's a topic we're discussing, but maybe now quite isn't the time. Thank you. I have a question about the goals. Uh, this is we're voting on the edits that you made. Or what? It, what exactly are or not voting, but you're just right, showing right this now, to us and right now you're not voting. No, I know yeah. not now. I'm talking. Yeah. We're looking at the agenda for next week. I understand. That. Mm -hmm. So we're going to discuss it further in executive because, as the board is aware, the district goals relate directly to my evaluation. So I want to discuss the goals as they relate to my evaluation. So I think that's an important executive discussion, just like we discussed it last year. Um, but yeah, the the goals. Uh, you know, we, we can discuss them further as they relate to how I'm being evaluated. But in general, the goals, if you look at last year's goals and this year's goals, uh, you know, we partially 
We made partial progress on the goals last year, but did not fully achieve them. So I think that it would make sense for us to keep the same goals in place because we only made partial progress toward them. And we all know that last year was the most challenging, most disjointed, disrupted year we've ever seen in education. And quite honestly, you know, everyone's working hard this year, but this year isn't looking so different with the exception of the fact that we actually have students in the building every day and we're doing full days with lunches. So there are differences, but that, that doesn't mean the level of difficulty has decreased for our, for our staff members. So um, no matter what, I think the goals are worth while goals still. But that's something we're going to discuss in executive session, right? Yes, we'll discuss it further then. Okay. All right. So I'm going to move on to instruction and program exhibit P. Does anybody have anything that they want to bring up or address from ex exhibit P? Hmm. Budget and finance. So we're going to look through that. Do we have anything that we want to address? For letters A through T, understanding the highlighted portion T. I have a question for Mr. Burns. Mm -hmm. So anytime, uh, Mr. Stephen Burns, that we have a figure for a higher, like a one-to-one -one aid, or I guess that's usually what I see here, and I see a, a, a money figure. Anytime I see that, I should know 100% that that include, includes salary and benefits. Is that correct? I mean, yeah, I mean, these, these, are, these are school districts we're dealing with. Um, so it's always salary and benefits included. Oh yeah, I mean, there's not a different charge. It's all, it's an all-inclusive charge for that aid. Okay, because I'm always used to looking at salary, like my step guide as a teacher. And when I look at my yearly salary, that's not including benefits. But this yeah, is something because, different. Remember, this isn't our this isn't our personnel. So when we, we're receiving an, a bill, basically, so they're mm -hmm. putting the entire amount on the bill. They're not breaking it. They're not going to break it down for us. There's no, when I, when I, used, I used to do this in Haddon Heights because I had send and receive relationships. I used to bill other towns, and I would I would come up with the total and and bill you know and just send them the invoice uh, or the or the contract. That's exactly what's going on here. We're just getting a contract for the aides from these school districts. Um, which is all based on whatever their district is. So I remember last month to being Morristown, they had their negotiated agreement. They got their they got their benefits. They got their FICA. They got their PERS. Um, it's it's I, the uh, the benefits the, the fringe benefits that people receive is more is, is extremely expensive, and people don't often equate that to their salary. But in reality, we all when we have those benefits at, at our positions, we make significantly more than we actually come home with because of all the benefits and the, the fight okay. get, the, the, the pension payments, all those different mm -hmm. things. So, yeah, uh, all those things oh, I got you. Okay. And on letter M, I was, I, I should have sent this to you as an email comment because maybe you, you're not ready to answer it. And then I, if you're not ready to answer it, I could always email it to you um, before, before the next meeting. But when I was looking through the King, this is letter M, the Kingsway Learning Center contract, it said that in addition to tuition, they could also charge for extraordinary expenses. And that yeah. would, so Sorry. is that, that something I should just ask you in an email before next meeting? No, it's, because I couldn't even tell you exactly what it is, but generally speaking, extraordinary expenses would be something like what the kid needs, um, occupational therapy or physical therapy or um, things of that nature. Uh, there would be things that could not be foreseen potentially, things that may come up. Um, I, I've never have seen, in my experience, I haven't seen a private district that's a private school. I, I've always seen it as the one to one aid, for example, that's often included in that. Um, my point mm -hmm. being is, I think the contract is the contract. I, I don't see much more going on there, not that I'm aware of. Okay, um, okay, no problem. That, but it could include those kind of things, like things that would be child study team related, generally speaking, like our, um, occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy, things of those natures could be some of those extraordinary things that maybe build once a week, once a so month. That, so that 64K could go up significantly. 
because of extraordinary expenses? Most, most likely not significantly, because uh, if it was something new on a routine basis, it would have been incorporated in the contract. Okay. And uh, the I would other- assume it would have been on a routine basis, is what I would assume. Okay. My, other, would... my other thing, my last um, comment is on letter S, contract with Bowman and company to provide section 132 qualified transportation plan for the 2022 school year at an annual rate of $275 and section 125 cafeteria plan for the 2022 plan year for the annual amount of $275. So I emailed you because I had never seen something like that before, but you told me that we have had that contract with Bowman for that specific service before. And it was something that the service they're providing is something that they're legally, we're legally required to provide, correct? Yes, uh, it's called, they call it a cafeteria plan. It's basically, it's a flexible spending account and uh, all school districts have to offer that to their employees. And the other one is something that was mandated maybe about a year or two ago is a mandatory transportation flexible spending account. So every district has to offer to their employees um, Employees don't have to participate, but we have to offer it. So we have to have a plan. And that's this contract, from my knowledge, well, you've always had a contract with somebody. I can tell you last year it was Bowman. And honestly, the only reason why I'm going there is more to memorialize it from a purchasing perspective. It's 500 bucks, it's 600 bucks. It's not something that's not a big expense. Okay. Now it's, it's just, I like doing it. I've always have put this on agenda. I can't speak for previous agendas, you know, previous years that this was put on there. I've always put it on there on my agendas, more from the way of memorializing the fact that we are complying and offering these services, more of just, you know, almost more of acknowledgement of it and, than else. Okay. And school districts usually go with an outside company to implement yeah. this? Yeah, I had them in Haddon Heights and Haddonfield, I both had a Meriflex, which was through... Often Brown and often the, the benefit advisor are your the benefit insurer or I'm not talking. The benefit broker for health benefits mm -hmm. often includes some of these benefits. So for example, Brown and Brown, who I had in Haddon Heights, they provided Ameriflex services with that fee. So mm -hmm. it went through them and it all worked out nicely. But uh so yeah, but everyone's everyone has a usually has a third party vendor to do it. Okay, thank you. Those were my questions on that section. Does anybody else have any other questions? Mm -hmm. To the budget and finance section of the agenda. Does anybody have any questions in regards to the operations and facilities exhibit II? Okay, policy, a motion is requested to enter the first rate. This is what's going to be requested at the meeting, just letting you know. A motion is going to be requested to enter a first reading. Um, and this was exhibit JJ in our public packet. So I hope everyone had a moment to review that. If not, I hope you review it prior to your next meeting. Um, but this is a policy that is going to come about for a first reading motion. Does okay, it two, discussion? Two days ago, it wasn't there, I don't believe, when I reviewed everything. So Mr. Mersinger, can you just go over any highlights, things that me, we might really want to uh, drill in on? Or is it a lot of very standard stuff. It's all, it's actually all very standard uh, language. Uh, half of the policies there are language changes related to No Child Left Behind, which it's no longer called No, no Child Left Behind. So those are wording changes that are taking place in, in those policies. And then some of the other policies are required policies where the wording has been changed based on new statutes. So it, this, this is one of the most basic policy updates I've seen in a very long time. Okay, thank you. Great. Um, I have a question about the policy. So one of uh, one of the items is gosh, how these broken down. Uh, a B C D uh, D two B. What page is that? What page is it on? Gosh, is there a, because there's like uh, it's number six in the PDF. I don't know what number. Okay. <laughs> or you, or you could just name. You could just give the name of the policy. Mm -hmm. um, it's a subsection of a policy about remote public meetings. Mm -hmm. 
and it says the board shall or shall not, I guess that's the decision mm -hmm. that we're making, mm -hmm. um, require members of the public to state prior to providing public comment whether they wish to speak and to identify themselves prior to speaking. Yes, we shall require that. Is that what we already have in place? So that's what we're deciding. I can't, that's the what we're already, the circle in the that's what we're already doing. Uh, so a lot of these policies where choices are being made, either the policy is already in place that way or the practice has been in place, but they still offer us that choice. My recommendation to the board with certain things is basically the same thing that we've already had with just the wording changes. So, you know, we do require that. So for example, uh, if, me if a member of the public wants to speak right now, they can't just blurt something out. You know, they, they right. need to be recognized by the president. They need to state that they wish to speak, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so it's, it's a process and it's, it's better than not having that. Maybe my broader question, having not been on the policy board is how do we know what in here is the stuff that we need to look at? Is it the thing with writing on it? That's what I thought. It was so, the all right, stuff so that's writing. good. That's a good question. So when you look at those policies, the, the, it depends on the policy that, that you're looking at. So for example, sometimes a policy will have a few uh, words in bold. Those are the only words that have been changed based on for example, new state statutes or new recommendations from the state, those words in bold are the changes. Everything else was already there. Sometimes there is a policy that's a completely new policy that you'll, you'll look and say, well, I don't see any bold words here at all. And that's because that whole policy is brand new. Um, but what I've done is I've reviewed every one of them and I just, I just kind of put some markings there saying, okay, because a lot of the times uh, the policies, we, we have to look at them more carefully and say, well, do, is that the language we want and all that? These ones are, are like I said, the most, some of the most basic things I've ever seen. So the, the, the changing from No Child Left Behind to the Every Student Succeeds Act or something to that effect, I mean, that's, that's just so basic. I don't know why our board would object to that. But it, it's, it's something for the board to view. And, and the policies... You know, it, that's an important task for the board. The board is a policy making governing body. So, you know, that that's why, you know, you're receiving them. Uh, I, I think I put them in the in the folder. It might have been on Friday. It might have been I, I, Steve and I would have to confer on that. But no matter what, you know, they we don't expect you to understand every policy or know every word of every policy. But but a lot of the policy language is already in our policies, it's just being updated in certain regards. And, and Joe, also, we should let those that have not been on the policy committee know that these are recommendations made by Strauss Estimate. We have people review these as well, that this is their job to review policy and provide us input as to what is a good direction to go in. And then it's for us to decide if that's truly the direction we want to help uphold. But it's, it's just important to know that it's not just you know, just going through policy, like, oh yeah, I think this is great. He's getting a recommendation off of what a professional has said and advised for our us to do due to either a legal reason, um, changing, you know, things have changed legally in the world or, or something new has come about and is now a new legal direction as well. There's a, you know, Strauss Esme provides these updates to say, hey, this is something to be aware of. Please update your policy to be current um, review it with your board to make sure that you all are in agreement that you want to provide this legal direction that we're advising you of. Yeah, I just, I, there's 152 pages so this and I, I scanned through most of them, but then I was like, there has to be a way to know what it's the part. No, and I, that's why when yeah, you're so like, section this, I was like, you know, you need to tell me the page yeah. <laughs> right here on my phone, like right next to me. So I would have it. And I'm like, Mm, I'm going to need to know. <laughs> actually, I was handwriting page numbers on there before, and I actually didn't do that this time, but they, they, I mean, they are, there are page numbers if you scroll down, the yeah. we will tell you. But no matter what, a lot of these policies are, if, if an option is given, sometimes it's already in existence anyway, and, and we don't need to reinvent the wheel when it comes to the options that are given. And then other times the board wants to do that. And, and again, I, I mean, I, I serve at the will of the board. It's, these are just my recommendations based on Strauss Esme's recommendations. So the board can say, well, we want to go in a different direction on a certain topic. I'm just saying I, I don't really see any hot button issues here that, that really require significant discussion. 
because we're talking about some new mandated policies, some wording changes, uh, nothing, nothing earth shattering, at least not in my view, because when there is, I draw attention to that with the board and say, well, here's a policy that we might really want to not have on the books for whatever reason, or here's the one that we really need to be uh, mindful of right now, that sort of thing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Got it. So, all right, so that's good. Um, personnel, does anybody have any questions related to the personnel aspect of the agenda? Any questions in regards to letters A through F? Are, are we going to be addressing that in um, any of this in executive session? That, that wasn't the plan. No, executive session is for district okay. goals and the superintendent's evaluation. Yeah, it's just that I don't, I had gone over and asked for a printout and I just have, all I got was the working session agenda. So even like, I, I don't have, um, you know, budget fine. I don't have the individual printed out, so I can't see them. That's why I was asking, is there anything? I don't, I can't see it. So I'm kind of flying blind. Well, perhaps between now and our meeting next week, we can work to get you that, the hard copies that you Yeah, have. that's what I will do. That's when I saw Karen today. That's what she kept saying. I said, well, unless we're doing it differently, that should be there. But I said, I'll get it before the next meeting. So that's all. It's just that it, like I say, it's flying blind for me, so. Understood, understood. Yeah. And once you get it, then send it, you know, if you have any questions, send yeah, it, yeah. your questions in, you know. Um, does anybody have any questions in regard to the board liaison reports that um, Mr. Jenkins, Mr. Litwack, and Ms. Tersh's Keeley may bring up? Did you want to hear about anything now? Or did you want to wait to hear about it at the meeting? on next week it's totally up to the to the board i don't know if anybody has any updates uh i'll go sorry uh, I, oh well, i'll start with cameron. Yeah. i'll just go in order cameron is there anything that you wanted to provide us during our work session in regards to your report for riverside uh nope nothing at this time marissa our meeting is tomorrow night i think we have a pre-meeting at 6 or 6 30 so i'll have a more comprehensive report next wednesday if i'm able to attend i will be in louisville oh well aren't you so fortunate so <laughs> all right all right for you um, yeah right hey, hey it, you, you, hey cameron you go down to kentucky to cut some of the bluegrass or what mm -hmm. um <laughs> nope i'm going down to kentucky to go to that's the good you can It just went out with, to go to the the landscape and lawn convention at in uh, Louisville. Okay, cool. It makes total sense. Then you'll have a nice time. I like it. It's a nice, oh, nice sure. place. Um, Did you have anything, Harry, that you wanted to address? Hi. Yeah, uh, the yeah. Uh, just to remind once again all the school board members that we both have uh, um, the end of October, the twenty sixth, twenty seventh, twenty eighth, the school boards conference convention uh, that's virtual and that will be you know that's where we're all signed up for it and we all should be taking advantage of it as best we can to help us understand what's going on and to find out answer some of the questions that some of us may have about various topics they have they made the programs to be like 30 minutes, 40 minutes. Um, you know, they, they did it last year, worked out well, they're fine tuning it. Uh, also, uh, with just today, uh, I believe we were scheduled for December 14th for Burlington County, the next meeting at Medford Village, and it's moved to December 16th. And anybody on the board is invited to attend as well. So that is what I what I have is liaison with the school boards association. I I did, I don't know, I guess I can bring it up here or bring it up under new business. Um, but I saw in the paper the township's synopsis of the 2020 report of audit of the township of Delanco. 
and might be a new business. Uh, a new business, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's fine. Yeah, cool. Okay. Um, thank you, though. Um, Catherine, did you have anything to report high level from the township committee? Um, I, I don't need to go into detail about everything, but um, I did talk to Mr. Mersinger was that last week. I've lost all track of time somehow. Um, about the uh, the township was awarded a grant. I should say the Shade Tree Commission Committee was awarded a grant to purchase approximately 250 trees for the town, and they propose at the township meeting um, giving some to the school to use. So I can let Joe talk about uh, you know his decision around that if he wants to. But um, mm -hmm. it was just a nice gesture, I thought so. Absolutely. Yeah, on, on the lawns that we can't keep up cutting, we'll plan. Them. I suggested that's, that's evergreens because they don't need as much maintenance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So thank you, Catherine. I appreciate that you brought that to my attention. The last time these trees were offered, we had a number of trees offered a few years ago, and we had to decline just because of a couple of factors, including our facilities team possibly not being able to keep up with the maintenance of the trees. But uh, this time, you know, Stephen Burns. Tim Allen and I, we looked at it and we've decided to accept four trees. And I know that's a very modest amount, but four trees is better than zero trees. So we really appreciate the township and the Shade Tree Commission. Uh, and, and we're looking at uh, beautifying the, the, one of the spaces at Walnut with, with those four trees. So Great. thank you, Catherine. Awesome, thank you. Okay, and again, the agenda has things that we will discuss during that meeting, which would include old business, new business, the distributions, we would request public comment on a non agenda item and go into executive session if necessary. So that is the draft for the October 20th agenda. Do we have anything in old business today off of workshop to discuss at this um, point in time? Yes, I have a couple things. So Last um, last meeting, I was talking about bullying and making sure every every employee is on board. And Mr. Mersinger was saying, "Well, some some employees are outsourced, so that's not our responsibility, really, to do the same level of in service." So, and I think Mr. Mersinger, you said you would talk to Mr. Heiser about the buses or something like that, and so the bus drivers would know about bullying reporting so did were you able to do that so we do we do um have bear some responsibility when it comes to anybody being informed of our policies and practices in relation to bullying and that is correct i mean when it comes to training uh it i i, I would actually like for the outsourced companies to provide that training so i did speak with mr heiser and uh they they are all staff members that work for school districts are trained in HIV, harassment, intimidation, and bullying, uh, including our staff members. So, so are the Morristown staff members. Uh, so, and that's something that I understand it's important for us to be aware of. It's important for staff members to know about that uh, there are steps that need to be taken when it comes to that topic. So I fully agree that it's important for everyone to be trained and to know what to do. At the same time, you know, the question is who's responsible? I mean, I, I, I just don't see it being appropriate for Delanco to be training staff members that aren't ours, but if they're staff members of another district, they are already being trained. Okay, just to follow up on that, um, I think I made the point last time that we all, we're still going to be held liable as a district if something happens, even if it happens in the presence of, an, of, of a person that we personally are not responsible for training. Is that a correct statement? Did you, do you understand what I mean? Who are you asking, dear? Uh, Mr. Mersinger, sorry. So if if there's a bullying incident and it's very severe, it goes to say a lawsuit and it happened on a bus, our district will be held responsible, not the bus company, correct? Well, I can't answer legal questions like that. All I can okay, say Mrs. is uh, Ms. Garin, steps to maybe fulfill our responsibility. It, there would, uh, I mean, it, every situation is different. I, I don't like making blanket statements. Um, it is very possible that the bus company would be sued. Actually, it's, it's probable that the bus company would sue. When people bring lawsuits, they sue everyone and their mother 
um, from the individuals to who those individuals are employed for. So they would probably sue a teacher involved, the superintendent, the bus driver, the bus driving company and the school district. And then through the course of the lawsuit, it would get vetted out who bears actual liability. Okay, so I'll have to research to see if that's ever happened. If like an outsourced bus driver made the school district liable because they didn't know the procedures. I'll research you that. Have the so, I'm sorry. Um, Ms. Garen's uh, comment. Our, our, the GIF would probably also, if there was fault on the bus company, would probably try to go to subrogation. And Ms. Garen, you could probably mm -hmm. do that as well. Um, basically, what that means is if we were sued and there was fault, or uh, basically the fault was pro on, a, on a company, the, 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 our insurance would then basically almost like counter sue as a way of saying they basically go after the person who was at fault. Okay, but the, the main point is we want to prevent all of this, not just the money side, but any suffering to the child who's really being bullied. So now the, the next thing I want to ask is about um, um, Mr. Burns, you were telling me about the student activity funds. Right now we have around 16,000 and you, I think, I believe you said in the email that the student advisors decide how to spend that money. So I was wondering, um, you know, when when do they decide, like uh, have the student advisors been told how much money they can use this year? And what is the procedure for that? Because I'm totally unfamiliar with that procedure, spending the student activity fund money. It's the, the advisors pretty much have, you know, when they, when they, when they, I mean, this year we don't have, I forget, I mean, it's drama, drama's running. So drama, if they have a fundraiser, they'll input money. And when they have to pay for something, they'll expend money. Um, so that 16,000, that's all going to be used for drama this year then? No, since no, activity? there's different ledgers in each thing. So each activity that, that we've had over the last however many years has a ledger, there's a student council. Um, no, but I mean, right now we have 16,000 to spend, right? No, the... The students have sixteen thousand to spend. Right. Okay, the, they have the, it. The board and, has nothing. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. That as a district, the students have that. And so, what advisors are going to decide for this upcoming year? So, the drama advisor would decide how to use part of that sixteen thousand. Is that right? Yeah. Exactly. It and then, what person. other what other advisors do we have? Like, we got the drama advisor, and who else? I don't know that answer, but, but if it's not- just, we, we, have, we have one extracurricular activity this year. We have a drama club. So we got all that 16,000, that advisor will decide how to spend that 16,000? No, that, no, no, Vera. Stephen just said that the money is divided into different accounts. So for example, I, I don't know the number, but the drama account might have $400 in it. So the okay. drama club advisor would then determine how to spend that $400 based on what the students in the drama club need. And if they do fundraisers, then they might have 400 more dollars. And then the drama club advisor would determine how to spend that money. So I'm just trying to ask a very simple question. How is that 16,000 that we, that the students now have, how is that being divvied up for this it's, coming it's, year? It was, it was Did you ever have an account for a child, Vera? You no, don't I have just to want to ask you about the funds. school. So, yeah, so but that's it. It's the same concept. That so you don't our, have so to spend the money because it's in the account. So could so since we have that sixteen thousand, couldn't we? We don't have the it, students. Since do. the students have it and we oversee that money, how is that money going to be used? Does anyone have an idea? It would so, be rolled over, right? But that yeah, what happens is exactly. the money stays in the account yeah. and it's used in the future. So, for example, there's a chorus account, there's a band account, there's a drama yeah. account, and so on and so forth. So none of that can be used right purpose. now, except maybe for drama, because we don't have those extracurriculars right now. But it Is could be used saying? for band or chorus as well, because even though that's not a stipend position, we have a music teacher that is doing, uh, definitely doing band, and we're talking about adding chorus at some point. Okay, so is this money that was, okay, I, I, I wanna ask my last question now. So last meeting, uh, uh, um, a board of end member asked a question, I believe it was Vince, and 
I think Marissa or Mr. Mersinger said they did not have an answer at that time or they were not prepared to answer. I would have to look at the video for the exact wording, but it's been weeks since then. And I, so I'm going to ask the question again now, and maybe you found the answer since it was asked weeks ago, which is how, what is the hourly fee for our lawyer at these meetings? What is her hourly fee? So you still don't have I mean, that? I feel, like, I feel like we just took a, a really sharp left turn from student activities to talking about the, the hourly fee. Park okay, so I guess, you don't have that. I guess you don't have that. Um, this was a question from the last It, it feels meeting. like a non sequitur to me and, and a non sequitur. I don't have to speak don't understand in sequence. What that is. All I have to do is have topics that are old business. And since this was <laughs> carried over from the other meeting, I'm asking it now, but I think you don't have an answer. Would you have an answer by the next meeting? I, do I don't follow even up remember and about, responding to this question. I'm sorry, what's that, Joe? I don't even recall responding to that question. I can look in the video. I think it was Marissa who said, I'm not prepared to answer it. I said, I, I think that, well, I mean, I personally am not prepared to answer that. Absolutely not. And I think that that's something that could be brought up in an email. It doesn't necessarily have to be brought up during the public session. And I think that maybe that's probably the best way to get the response. Well, I think the public should know because that's their money. So, okay, I'll, I'll bring it up in an email. I'll, I'll ask it in an email and I'll inform the public during a meeting. Well, so no problem. well here's I mean, what can happen, because Stephen, anyway. <laughs> Stephen Burns is the business administrator. He's the one that is more privy to all the bills than anybody else in the district. He can look at the bills, he can share the information with the full board via email, and that'll be that. I just, I'm sorry, but I thought we were talking about student activities and then suddenly we weren't anymore. It, the topic is old business. It's not just student you're, activities. You're trying to control the agenda, which is a oh problem. Oh my gosh, which is one of I'm the following procedure, but need, now I will leave it to, to you. Have Let's have a lawyer on. present because of some of the difficulties that individual board yes, members sure. were presenting, Vera. Okay. You um, know, it's like a catch-22 that you don't realize that you're providing. I'm personally against having the lawyer here and using that money. I would like to use that for yeah, extra but because of your behavior, it's part of the reason we have to have the lawyer I, here. Nobody has nobody has made an ethics complaint against me, and if I'm because that would also incur additional legal fees and additional time. No, incurred. it wouldn't. There, I made that's an a, that is unfortunately not and accurate. It was free. That is I'm unfortunately here. not accurate. <laughs> But either, July. Either, either way, um, Stephen, at 9 p.m., Vince Caliguire left the meeting. If you could please note that. And then July 2021, Vera, I know I received I an ethics other board complaint. It was absolutely to the members free. of New Jersey School it's a Ethics. Totally Commission. different situation, Vera, when it's against a Excuse board me? member by a board member. But the board has to have legal representation. Yes. Can I just clarify really board, to, to help? Uh, and I don't know. We we do have different hourly rates. If I knew what our hourly rate was off the top of my head, I would gladly share it. But I actually don't know Delanco's rate. The um, an ethics complaint is a legal process. Um, what Miss Darmo filed was a general complaint. Um, it was not um, in the form of a formal ethics complaints. It, it was more like a, a letter with a list of issues attached to it that was referred to the executive county superintendent and addressed at that level. An ethics complaint, you don't have to be a lawyer to address one. Many boards of education will use their lawyers to do it. Anyone can file an ethics complaint. It looks a lot like um, a complaint in my world is a legal term of art it has a specific form and a very specific look to it. It looks like a lawsuit. You write it up, you serve it on everyone, and it follows legal process. That is an ethics complaint. It does incur, boards do incur costs when you go through it, because even if you don't use your attorney to write it, you use your attorney to defend it. So I just wanted to offer that as a bit of clarification and perhaps move this conversation forward. Okay, let's move that. on. Thank you. Yep. 
Okay. Anybody else have anything for old business? I have something for old business, Marissa. Yeah, I just. Wait, wait. Go ahead. Sorry, Phil started first. Okay. My thing for old business yeah, is yeah, when are we yeah, going yeah. to go back to a live meeting? When are we going to have an in-person meeting? I think that's extremely important. I think, you know, we can't do this Zoom meeting. Sure, everybody loves Zoom meetings, but we need to meet in public. I think we mentioned at the last meeting we were going to reevaluate this in November um, to, to have another discussion about this because it was enabling Stephen to notify and provide um, notice um, both written and electronically in the proper time frame to do so. And he was going to do it in a financially savvy way. And we said we would revisit this in November. And originally the reason why we went virtual as opposed to in-person, just as a quick backstory, was a tech technology issue. Um, so many in the public wish that we could live stream and have everything, basically have it as if it were a Zoom meeting, but have us in person. And currently we don't have the capability to do that. We had the professionals um, come in and provide us some input on that. And at this point in time, they just said that we don't have the, the technology to have what we what it seems everybody would want, which is their cake and eat it too. Everybody wants it all. Um, so if we were to go in that fashion, it would be a more restricted type event where perhaps the live streaming aspect would not be available. It could be an in-person meeting with maybe a recording that would then later be posted. But again, these were discussions that we had at the previous meeting and that we can absolutely have again to decide on how we want to proceed forward. Because I agree with you, Phil. I, I love the in-person um, aspect of it. I think that there's great value in it. And um, if we can find a way to keep everybody happy and, and, and make it happen, then yeah, I, I'd love to do it. But right now, because of the audio component of this, um, it doesn't allow us to have it the way that the majority would prefer it to be. And that includes those in the community as well. So we're trying to find ways to keep everybody happy and everybody informed. Unfortunately, when we do that, there are some parties that don't necessarily agree. And I totally understand that as well. Because like I said, I, I agree. I, I was always saying all along that I wanted to be in person. I think that there's great value in it. But I also understand that if we want to keep the fashion that we're going in right now, we don't have the technology to support it. And I understand that, you know, we did have a good relationship with Morristown until we lost that. And I'm sure Morristown would have helped us out. But I do think it's something that we have to seriously get back to. That's my two cents on that. Thank you. We thank we, you. Uh, Phil, Phil, we still do have the Morristown tech team working with us. Oh, we do? I didn't realize. You know, yeah, Albert, Albert is a member of the Morristown tech team and they still work with, with us. It's just they they know that we don't have the equipment that would be necessary or even the manpower that would be necessary when it comes to set up, breaking it down, and making sure that it's all done in a timely fashion in a in the school when it, the space is already being used by the students, uh, staff members, and so on. So it's it's it was a logistical issue, a financial issue. There were a number of things that the Morristown team cited for us. Okay. We can I still think we revisit it. We can revisit that in November, like we had planned. I think that's a great opportunity. Old old business, if I may, um, that was actually brought up by Vera uh, last time, and I just wanted to thank Mr. Dovey and especially Mr. Dovey's wife for for working um, as a teaching assistant, especially during this time that a lot of people aren't. And I'm glad that both he and his wife were promoting education and and serving the communities. So thank you. And, and please thank your wife as well. Exactly. Yes, please. Um, I was hoping to revisit the topic of um, like building our relationship with the township committee uh, mm -hmm. through Stephen Burns. Um, I know that we've brought that up before. So I'm hoping this is a good time to chat about that again. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess more generally, uh, we haven't had a very good relationship with them in the past, and I would love to do whatever we can to open up lines of communication so that they understand some of the issues that we're having with the budget. Um, I know there's going to be a new crop of 
uh, or potentially I should say a new crop of uh, members joining in January. Um, so I just wanted to kind of get that on, you know, Stephen's radar, um, Mr. Mersinger's radar uh, to make sure that, you know, in the next several months we kind of get a plan in place, hopefully. And um, well, I'll wait for new business for the other aspect of it. I didn't know if there's a, anything else you wanted to discuss in that regard. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm happy to continue to be the liaison to the township. I feel like I'm probably a bit of a poster child when it comes to that relationship for um, negative memories, feelings um, with the township committee. So I don't know how far I will get with uh, trying to persuade them to our uh, to uh, improve our relationship. But um, if there's anybody else who's willing to step up as the committee liaison, um, I'd be happy to have you take a stab at it. <laughs> hey, Catherine, with all due respect to your opinion of yourself, I, I don't, I disagree. I think that you've done a great job as the li liaison with the township. And I, I would say that if there's any negativity, it is certainly not you at the center of it or you causing any of it. So, I mean, that's, that's just my, perception of it. I, I, I guess everybody's own self-perception is different, right? You know, if you look at yourself as liaison and say, well, there, there's controversy surrounding me as a person, maybe it's not you, you know, maybe there are other forces at work here when it comes to the interactions with the township, uh, with various aspects of things that we've, we've talked to the township about, whether it's the library or other topics. I don't think that it relates to you as much as there, there have been difficulties with the relationship with the township, as you've said, long before I arrived, uh, you know, since the time of Joe Miller, since the time of other, other administrators that were here. So, I mean, I've heard the stories. I didn't live it, you know. So, and this is not, I'm not assigning blame to anyone. I'm just saying that maybe you're being too hard on yourself and that I don't think, I don't think that you're really at the center of it. I think that you're, you're doing a great job. Yeah, I and I would, I, would, I would echo what Joe was saying, and um, of course I support, you know, whatever choice that you're looking to get from this, but um, again, I, I echo what Joe says, and I believe that you've been a phenomenal liaison and have given us great input from your perspective, and I think that that is invaluable, and I think that there's nothing wrong with how you perceive the information you're, you're being, you're listening to, and I, you know, I, I think it's great that you're able to bring it back to us and to provide us that insight. I think that we've probably received more insight from you being a liaison than we've received in many years past. So I, I you know, it's a great, it's a great thing. And um, I, I really appreciate you doing that. And I know it's not always an easy thing to do as with anything else that we do as a volunteer and put our time into, but it's greatly appreciated for sure. I'll very, just make very the comment definitely. I think that it's I've a never... doing it, Kat. I do have a question for you. Is the township planning on going back to in-person meetings anytime soon? No. I'll make the comment that I've never heard any bad stories about the school and the township committee. And I'm very grateful for the high quality of leadership that we have at the township committee. That's my comment. Well, I think that you've done a great job, Catherine, and you know, at least complete the year and then reevaluate, you know what I'm saying? We all have our assigned duties and it just makes it easier when we, you know, we'll have new board members as well. And then we'll have the reorganization in January. And then at that point, if you're not comfortable, then, you know, maybe opt out. That's what I would suggest so that you know, because if someone else steps in now, they're not going to be affected. And our job isn't necessarily, our job is once again, I'm going to keep reasserting it, is to benefit the students. The students, we're not elected to the township. We have a different agenda. And um, it'll, I don't know if there's any other old business, but it kind of leads into the new business. So I'll just stop now if there's any other new business or old business, I'm sorry. I, well, I do not have any other old business, but Catherine. I'll, I'll lead in. To, well, I guess is, I'm just curious, kind of what, know, what Stephen Vera, feels maybe, like his time frame is for uh, Vera, you know, might, when he feels like he'll be, be able to reach to, out. 
Wait, Harry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Because both of you are talking on top of each other. Harry, yeah. Karen was finishing yeah. up the thought is in, and she was speaking to Stephen. So I just wanted to give her the opportunity because when the both of you speak, it, it breaks. Sure, me. sure. Cool. Yeah, I mean, the, the first part of that was just more about when, uh, I don't know what I'm hoping to get out of this other than to say that I would, you know, I would love to see some sort of plan in place to make sure that we open lines of communication, especially before both groups start discussing budgets for next year. So um, I don't know, Stephen, what are your feelings about that? I know you've just gotten on the job and you have a lot on your plate. So I'm, I'm well aware of that. I'm not expecting you to yeah. call them tomorrow, yeah, but. Because I only work three days a week too. So, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's not, uh, I feel. Do you speak a little louder, Steve? Yeah, I do. Steve, I you're feel, away from the mic. I feel, you. you know, working three days a week and being new to the position here, um, I, I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. But uh, obviously, when, whenever we can utilize them, I would expect to utilize them. So when Harry brings up the fact that having a shared service, I'll, I'll reach out to them. I don't see why I wouldn't. Um, so, I mean, I, I have no problem reaching out to them for those kind of things. So I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, I think what, what, the, what just based on conversations I've had with them in the past, what, what everybody's kind of hoping for is just an introduction. Like, hey, I'm Steve Burns. This is how you reach me. Um, you know, this is what my job is. I don't know, something like that. <laughs> so that they like at least have a context. So, because very often they're having conversations um, where I think they would like to have potentially your input, uh, but they, they don't know who you are or like how to contact you. So then they, you know, like, and I'm not somebody that they want to talk to necessarily all the time. So, um, so I think it would just be helpful if, if maybe you just said, hey, I'm the new BA for the school board. Um, let me know if I can ever. Yeah, I don't have a problem doing that. But on the flip side, I don't know who they are either. Yeah. I, I don't, I'm not working anything personal. I'm just saying I don't know who they are. Uh, I'm not even sure who I'm reaching out to, to be honest. To you. I'll ask Joe, though. Uh, here's a thought. Uh, maybe, Joe, if this is something you're comfortable with doing, would you be willing to extend the, hey, we have a new business administrator, we wanted to introduce him to you, just kind of like send an email to the township committee, uh, you know, it's informal, but that way too, it doesn't take from Stephen's time. But at the same time, the township's getting that initial introduction as to who Stephen is and how he's supporting us as a school board and a district. I think that would be, um, it would be a nice, it's like an olive branch, and, but it, yet at the same time, it's a, it's a limited olive branch. You know, it's nothing too crazy. I don't know if that's something you're, you feel comfortable doing or that you'd even, you know, you have time to do, but. I'm a hundred percent comfortable with that. I can absolutely do that. And I just wanted Stephen to have a chance to get his bearings in the district. Oh, yeah. He's now been with us for a few months. So I think it's, you know, it is time to, to start having that conversation with the township committee but again i feel like like we were saying earlier i, I think there's that there have been miscommunications or misunderstandings in both directions i you know i think that it's important for us to understand how our budget works understand how their budget works and so on and so forth because that's what i think there there, there is misunderstanding related to that related to taxation really you know and i know bob doby is very experienced as a as a former township committee member so I don't think that there's really any, um, I wouldn't even call it negativity or animosity. I just think that we, we are kind of in a state of misunderstanding when it comes to certain aspects of taxation and budgeting and other topics like that. And I think maybe uh, Catherine is correct that Steve Burns could be uh, somebody that, that helps to provide, sorry, helps to provide some clarity in that area. Catherine, I'd be happy to work with you. Um in setting this up. Right now, Township Committee is in the midst of their budget discussions for next year. So that's going on now and will go on uh, probably till after the first of the year. They start to uh, finalize stuff. But um, I'd be happy to work with you. Uh, but I think you, you've done a good job in trying to reach out and trying to, you know, trying to uh, open the lines of communication and uh, would encourage you to continue to do that. But I'd be, be happy to work with you. 
Thanks, Bob. <laughs> Thank you. I think though, um, Bob, you know, just I actually appreciate that 100% because you're a former township committee member. <laughs> and I could spearhead this by at least just sending a message and mm -hmm. say, that, you know, not only Steve Burns, but we have a few board members, you know, for example, Marissa, Bob, and, and Catherine, who would like to meet and discuss topics related to budgets, taxation, et cetera, just so that we're all on the same page. And, and, and again, like Catherine's saying, just an introduction of our new business administrator. Uh, this is my fourth business administrator in eight years. So absolutely, I think that's important. Yeah, I think that's great. I think that would be a great starting point. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, and then into new business. Um, I know Harry had brought up in an email about board docs. Is that something you wanted to discuss a bit more, Harry? Yeah, but I'd like to hold that and just continue with, because it's right on the same wavelength we're talking about now, the relationship between the township and the school board and the relationship between budgets between for both of them. and working in a cooperative way because they're the same taxpayers. They're no different people that are represented by both the school board and by the township council. And I saw it was in September 29th paper, the synopsis of the 2020 report of the audit of the township of Delanco. And when I read through it, I see where they have and it was actually Janice Lohr signed off on it. So I, you know, doing my due diligence in the way that I believe I'm supposed to, I contacted Steve Burns and Steve gave me a reply. And I said, well, I'm gonna ask the township because my question, I wasn't thinking we didn't get money from them. The question is how they use the money that they're owed from us you know, we're, we're, we're getting money. They, it's a liability on is how they account for it. There was a deferred liability of local district school taxes of $1,443,291.44 as of December 31st, 2020. And once again, that same amount that was from the previous year. So when I look at it, it looks to me like it's a, a line item, not a you know, that it's not in the regular budget. So I, and what does it mean? And I think that's something that needs to be explained to the entire board because I called Janice Lohr who said, you know, I just signed off on it. I said, fine. She put me in touch with Bob Hudnell. I don't know if anyone knows who he, who yes. he is, but for the last 23 years, been the CFO uh, for the township. And he explained somewhat, and um, at some point it was that it was a problem because it was from 30 years ago with Florio, and then uh, I still wasn't quite understanding or satisfied with the explanation. So he put me in touch with Richard Schwab, who said, oh, it has to do with from 20 years ago when McGreevy was the so I'm not sure. And he said, oh, well, this is how we've always been doing it. But what does it mean for us as a school board? Because if there, this is the liability because we have our, our budget year runs from, you know, July 1st to June 30th. And the township budget is from January 1st to December 31st. And a couple of years ago, the then mayor, yeah, can you hear me? Because it's coming on my thing. The then mayor came in to the school board meeting, giving us all our individual, you know, uh, printed out the budget for the, uh, you know, for the township, and that we, you know, we don't know what we're doing. We're, you know, we're not. And this is part of, as it goes back and how it affects us, how it affects the school board is that it's part of the, the 30 year pilot program that the school board will never see profits from 
And at a time when there was a meeting, a sit down meeting, it was after the fact, after the shovels were already in the ground and the, you know, the ink had dried, but for the next 30 years, we have a budget problem that we didn't create, but we have to live with. And likewise, you know, the township has to act accordingly about the low income housing fine. And they, they solved a problem for them, but created a greater problem for us and a real problem for us. And it needs to be understood. So I suggest we ask either the mayor, the current mayor, or uh, Richard Schwab, the town manager, explain it to all of us at once, because I would like to explain it to you, but it sounded like it was kind of a circular argument of a dog chasing its tail, that it we've always done it that way and blah, blah, blah. But that money it is basically the way it was explained was, you know, that's that's why I asked earlier, the billing, is it every month? Is it every, you know, it's on their books as a liability. And what does that mean? What does that mean? What they can do with that money is they use that to do kind of deals that are in effect causing us financial difficulties on the school board. Either, you know, I mean, I don't think it's with intent, but it certainly is what's coming about from those decisions. And we should understand it. So Vera, maybe you should, you know, if you want to go into accounting and, you know, um, testing the, you know, legal and the uh, accounting systems, you might want to focus on that. You're saying that everything is hunky-dory with the city. Um, it affects the municipal budget, affects the school budget. And likewise, once again, the same company that had a 30-year pilot with us, had a 30-year pilot with Evesham, and when the board brought it to the attention of how it affected them, the Evesham Municipal Government worked with them and made adjustments. That did not happen here. Just the opposite. We're, we're told, hey, it's your budget, solve the problem. Okay, since you but brought my name up, we create I'll, a problem. I'll just say something since you brought my name up. The money they get from that pilot, they put into the town for whatever expenses they have. They give us that money. They still have their expense. They still need my tax money. So, so it, it, it doesn't make sense to me to say, oh, we should get that money. They use that money for what we need for the town. If they don't have that money, my taxes still have to go up to pay whatever deficit there is. Yeah, so that's if we right. need money, if we need money, we got to raise taxes. I'm trying to see like you where we can save it We're and capped. put the most that we can under, into education. That's what you I'm understand that we are capped. What is it? Four percent now. They, they doubled it last year that we go to four. You know, Vera, do you understand that for 30 years there is no any any child that goes into living in those 64 units that comes into our school system isn't necessarily taxed we don't get anything from it it costs us special ed we I have know, students that's that live pilot. there we've never seen There's yeah a, that's and a you're saying it isn't a problem it had it had to be a pilot for what i understand i didn't understand this yeah before. from that's the spin because that's it's, from the council you're state representing regulation, the of not state, not just the taxpayers the students state the taxes will go up taxes uh, blah, 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 always go up it's not like a, you know, you want to believe what you want to believe, Vera. So okay, so okay. if we need but if we need more I'm money, saying that we could go to the taxpayers if we wanted to have a higher budget, correct, Mr. Mersinger? Could we go to the taxpayers if we wanted more money above the cap? Yes, we could have the community vote on the the um the budget. That has not been done for a number of years, uh, and historically. In many districts, but budgets have been voted down. Uh, we would prefer that not to happen. Uh, so we stay within the cap. Uh, we also have enrollment adjustments. We have health care adjustments. We have bank cap, et cetera, et cetera. We have certain things that will add to that amount. Um, but uh, 
So we can go above 2% based on certain adjustments, but uh, other than that, we would need to put it to a vote to the community. Okay, so it's up and to the just community. Just like you said, Vera, you don't wanna pay more taxes. So you're on the board saying, I don't wanna pay more taxes, I'm trying but to use it's okay if- Actually, <laughs> uh, what? I'm trying to, I'm trying to do things. Uh, well, I don't even want to unveil my plans yet because they haven't. Well, make your secret. It's a nine member board, Vera. Should I tell my secret? Board. Okay, I'll tell my secret, but I'm not working your at the board. Your secret plans, of... we can't even see you on the okay, screen. Let, let me tell your you, if you listen, if plan. you listen, you'll know. I, I care about the tough times that people are going through now. I don't think they would vote to have the taxes go up and I care about the kids. So I'm working with Pastor Waleska Trinidad through the Dobbins Church and we're trying to get a volunteer tutoring center going as we speak. I am doing this with the pastor and with the help of the trustees. I have a meeting with her Friday and I haven't talked about it because I'm doing it as a resident. I'm just mentioning it now You're on because the board. you can't yeah, do this. I can't do that it's a as a facetious, I can. It's a facetious <laughs> distinction that you're making. And I am it's doing it. It's something that. that's, that's great. And it, it should be happening. That's great. That's wonderful. But that, that has nothing to do with school board issues. That you I'm, as a community member. I'm only member, bringing it up. And I'm only bringing it up that. because I'm only bringing it up because money is tight. Uh, the budget voters won't vote to uh, raise taxes, I don't think. Vera, do you so understand why the something. budget is tight? I have you to understand? do something yes, Robert, and, I, and I am doing something. Yeah, but do you understand why the budget is tight? Do you Harry, understand that the that what you're saying, oh, it's great. They're I would like to move on. Town, I would like to move it's on. It's not coming to the school board. The The 40,000, 60,000, $100,000 that we're putting out for special ed kids, we're not even seeing. But it's only for the next 28 years, I guess now. Hey, Harry, in your, uh, Harry, yeah. with, what, with what you were saying, uh, myself and I believe it was Marissa and also Vince did have a meeting with the deputy mayor and the mayor a couple years ago. And we brought up some of the same things that you were bringing up right now. And unfortunately, the township didn't have any money to help us at that time. Yeah, they have a almost a million and a half liability that is that comes from the schools. That's Harry, what they're trading. Uh, with. Harry, so that's they, the, uh, they collect the tax money for all the entities. So the money that's owed to the schools is considered a liability against the revenues that they're collecting, the tax revenue. So that's where you, that's where the, the liability comes that's in. Weird. So it's a liability I mean, because they yeah, owe the schools I mean, that money that right. they've collected on you, on our behalf. Yeah. And because the budgets aren't aligned, you know, by time it presents, you know. Yeah. The there, was, there, there was, there was a. Still remember. Uh, I think there was at, a, this, this goes back it five, goes six back, years, I think at one point. No, it actually goes back. No, 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 where, that. yeah, I know, but I'm saying where the school board acted, the, I believe, was asked by the township, instead of going for the 2% that we should have, oh, only go for one or zero, at first they wanted zero, I think they, we, we compromised with one, you know, there's been compromise on our end over the years, but you know, it, it turns around, this is what happened. And that's what I, it needs to be looked at, at just well, 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 you know, I, paving over the problem without seeing how the pothole got there, it'll come back, um, but it's I, only I 28 think, years. I, th I think I mean, maybe I'm there's, poorly. I think if we have some discussions you know, in, I say privately in a small group that's, you know, uh, not, uh, well, we, we, we can open up some, 
no, 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 it, that, because that's not going to get anything. That's not going to get us anything. So, uh, you know, I would say after the after the election uh, in November, um, you know, I, I think at that time is that's when we should sit down with Richard, uh, with uh, Bob, who's their uh, uh, CFO, and um, you know, perhaps Steve. Uh, and uh, Joe, I, I think we could probably sit down and just talk about our individual uh, situations so that we can see perhaps they may have some ideas for us. We can have suggestions, you know, back and forth to try and work this out because they do know that the schools affect the value of the town. You know, real estate wise, uh, quality, you know, wise, as far as the type of, you know, uh, citizens that we have. So I, I think, you know, sitting down and having that kind of a conversation and hopefully we'll understand what their issues are. Uh, we can ask the questions like, hey, can you change, you know, you have pilots can you change the distribution, you know, uh, of of how that money is is given to the township, uh, you know, where we would get a portion of of a, you know, perhaps some of the pilots. And I think right now there's probably three or four pilots. Two of them have to do with the um, affordable housing and the uh, uh, mansion uh, project. And, you know, those, you know, there are no, uh, well, there are no school kids coming out of the mansions. I don't believe there uh, at this time, there are that come out of the, uh, the crossings. Uh, and, you know, I think if they understand the impact, and I know Phil has worked the last couple of years very hard trying to get people to understand the impact that that had on our budget and on our schools. And, you know, so hopefully we can work together, uh, you know, and, and solve the problem that uh, we're both facing. I say both the school board and the, uh, and the township committee. And I think the members there that are there now and the ones that are running, I, I, I think they, they all feel that they would like to see, you know, this, this financial problem that the schools are having solved. So that's, yeah. my, that's my two and cents for the best interest. That's for sure. It's everyone's we best appreciate interest. It. And, yeah. and maybe start with them cutting the grass. You know, <laughs> you don't have to cost us money to have us save well, money. Well, there, there, if there's you some cost us money. That's some of the discussions we can have. Yeah, yeah. No, where, I know. Well, no, they no, can no. help us. Uh, maybe we can help them, you know. So I, I yeah, you know. that's how it's supposed to work in the community. Exactly. And we have a superintendent who represents us, and we have our, you know, business administrator. And, you know, we unfortunately, we did have a meeting like that, but it was an after the fact meeting. Yeah, that is like, you know, it's like telling you the, here you're going to have this problem for the next 30 years. So, well, um, what I it, what I see right now with no Steve, longer. Stephen has impressed me with it, the way he's he's developing yeah. uh, budget, our budget, uh, looking to the future, laying things out, um, making uh, trying to make sure we understand the process and are thinking, you know, of different scenarios i think he's done an excellent job i think part of that uh that would be something the township committee uh, would probably be impressed with also and uh, uh yeah so i you know I, like i said i i just think if we can sit down and talk in a um in an adult manner if you will we i, I think I'll, you know, so we can probably resolve some of the issues that are uh, confronting us right now. So, I let's agree. hope we can. I, I, that would be great. That's how we're supposed to operate. And I can't say it any more times, but I'll keep saying it many more times. It's the same taxpayers. 
It's, a, you know, it's not a different group of people. And the people moving into the senior development that um, I ran in actually yesterday in, in, on my bike ride in the Fernoulet, and, um, he, you know, I asked him about it. He said, well, it's, and I ride, I see those houses are being occupied. There's, um, and he said, it's a, an under contract about, he said it was about 60%, but there had been at that meeting I'm talking about projected numbers and then how that would be, have gone away by now, which it hasn't, because those were supposed to all have been sold by now. And just for people's understanding, the market has increased 12 to 14 percent at least. So what they were projecting those homes were going would go for, they're going for more now. And realistically, the people that move there already raised their children, paid school taxes somewhere else. That's not what they're hoping to accomplish by living here. They're looking to keep their taxes as low as possible, but they wouldn't have moved here unless they could have afforded a $350,000 home. But you have a population of uh, Kat and Steve and um, Cameron that plan on living, raising their families here, and they need and they deserve a top flight school system. And we need to make improvements. We all know that. So that, that's where, where how I look at the big picture of it, that if we all could work together, it does save taxpayer money. And it doesn't, you know, you can rob from Peter to pay Paul, but you still end up. And if we have to raise taxes in the town, if the town says, hey, we have to raise taxes so that we can have more money for our schools. There's all kinds of ways, if there's a political will, to accomplish things, so. I think we're on a, a much better course. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, even as we're moving forward in this process of having board of the whole, where our communication is much more adult, much more uh, practical, myself as well, because it's, you know, we have to have a format that we can all relate to and accomplish what we're trying to achieve, which is once again, the improvement of learning and academics. And in this day and age, because of the pandemic, the emotional, social growth and development of the children, you know, that's the adults in town, you know, since I've been here 20 years, there's, you know, we have a new administration building at much needed and the police, you know, when we have the town looks better than it ever has. So we're in the right direction, but now it's time to turn, not just the attention, but the resources to the schools, to the children, to build what needs to be done for those who are going to have children who want to raise them in this community. Mm -hmm. What is it that you wanted to discuss in regards to board docs? Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> that was the um, the New Jersey School Boards Association uh, at their last meeting introduced this board doc and would it all I wanted us to do is look in to see if that would make sense for us to get it's it's a way of once it's set up that the um, um, like chain of command of communication is automatically you know, puts people, they're able to reach certain information, they're not able to reach their certain information. And it was very impressive. And as most of you know, I'm not that versed with the technology. And I could understand the concept of why it would be useful, but I do not know the cost. It's a private company, apparently. But going through the school boards association, I'm sure it's discounted somehow. But and it may be out of our reach, because uh, I think Joe said what we use now it doesn't cost us anything, but that if I'm not mistaken, doesn't that isn't that reliant pretty much on you providing that information, Joe? Well, it's it's a it's Google Drive, comes at no cost to the district. Uh, we have Google-based email for board members. 
Uh, the drive includes all sorts of documents related to the board meetings. Steve is uh, very adept at keeping them organized as well. So as much as I like the idea of board docs, I would prefer not to spend money on something that we can do for free. Uh, I understand that concept, but I also understand the long-term concept and once it's set up. And it may be out of our price range, but the cost, you know, cost is you know, $37,000 to cut grass is, you know, is something that, uh, I mean, that's what I compare it to. Of where, where does it get spent? Administration, students, et cetera. It's, it's just to look into it. I don't know. I don't know what else they can provide. And it may be some of the technology that we're looking for, they might be able to provide. So the cost is between I, I don't know. I just think we should look into it. With that? Right. The cost is between $2,700 and $11,000, depending on what version you would want. One time fee or yearly? No, yearly. <sighs> You said how much? Twenty seven hundred. Twenty seven hundred to eleven thousand dollars. Yeah, I like free um, a lot better. Yeah, 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 yeah. If they accomplish the same thing, but you know that. Where did you get that from, Steve? On board docs. That, I emailed. I emailed the person on your email. Okay, good. I'm just assuming we would be on the low end that the eleven thousand are free really big districts, et cetera. Depends on the level of service. So it depends on what you're looking for. Yeah, yeah. It depends on the size of the district because in reality, it's what you're asking them to do for you. So for example, yeah. I had a personnel issue. I was able to go to someone, some district's website and search their board, board agendas for the last five, six years in a matter of an instant. So, there's, so my point being is they may pay the $11,000 for that kind of service. I don't know what the levels are of the service. Yeah, to put it all, to put everything. Yeah, that's what I say. It seemed like, from what I could tell, once that was set up, that all the information was right there and could be manipulated very quickly and consistently. And that information would, you know, you'd have different levels of what board information the board gets, what the principals get, what the teachers, what the community, et cetera. That it, I'm assuming now, Joe, that it's done by you just personally correct right now it's me and it's me and steve burns prior to that it was vicky and me james and me joanne and me <laughs> we also have of course support and assistance uh from karen hosier and now eileen grin prior to that nancy fox you know so it's it's a team effort in the board office to keep the files organized. And uh, I think we do well with it. And again, it's free. Yeah, no, fine. It's just like I say, once from my understanding, it seemed once that's in there, once it's organized and the data is in there that it would be helpful for our district going forward. And if we can't afford it now, we can't afford it now, but to know that it exists and what, you know, what it does for 2700 or whatever yeah okay i just wanted to bring it up as something that i'd come across and i had you know went through the channels and joe said hey it's good for new yeah. new business so very much that's so. it that's my new business awesome thank you all right if there's nothing further i will open this up for public comment on non-agenda items i do have one to read from the um online form and this one is from a Mr. Chris Wallace. Um, he's a Delanco resident and he would like uh, some clarification. A few meetings ago the board stated that they would meet in person for one of the two meetings per month. This sounded as though it would be for the student recognition awards. Then the board decided to stay virtual for both meetings because some members did not want to be in attendance. In attendance to a meeting to honor students that this board is supposed to be best to, to do the best for. So no once a month meeting to honor the students, but it was approved to have a book fair on a weeknight. How is it safe to invite people to the book fair in our school, but not to have them celebrate student achievement, achievements? Sounds like the board is now choosing and picking instead of having a set of rules to follow. 
make up your minds. If you if these board members rather stay home, then please have them resign. They serve no purpose other than their own. We appreciate that. I'm hoping that my um, explanation earlier helped provide a bit of clarification there. Um, does anybody else have any additional comments? Um, well, so, uh, Marissa, it's important to point out too that the, the PTO book fair is a PTO event. They utilize the building for that. That is approved by our director of facilities. Uh, it's reviewed by, by the business administrator and myself. That, that is not the same as the board conducting a meeting. Uh, and so everything is looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. Understood. Thank you. Does anybody else have a public comment on a non-agenda item? I know that Ms. Mater had her hand up for very, very long. I know that it's no longer up, but I didn't know if what she had to speak about was still something on her mind. First of all, I'm sorry. I didn't even realize it was up still. I just didn't notice that it was there and I had Who's it. speaking? I Who's guys. speaking? No problem. Please that identify yourself. Um, Dana Mater, and I'm not turning my camera on because I'm in my pajamas, so sorry. <laughs> no worries. No worries. <laughs> comment was on an agenda item that had to do with um, the custodial staff. So I don't know if that's time for me to comment now yeah, or not. You can bring uh, it up now. I, I just want to say that, um, you know, I got to sit in on a meeting um, yesterday and talked about the um, SR funds with uh, Mr. Mersinger and the other DTEA members and Mr. Burns. He was very thorough. It was a very informative meeting and we were very glad to be part of it. Um, I will say, you know, uh, about this other custodian that is going to be, um, or, you know, that was an idea. Um, Miss, Mr. Allen is doing a, a fantastic job and he's working hard, but I also have to give some credit to Mrs. Be Miss Best because she is doing three jobs for some people too. And um, just speaking as a Walnut teacher, um, we desperately need the help at Walnut. We do not have a full-time custodian there all day. Um, like I had a mop of spill in my classroom the other day, you know, myself in the middle of class and I had to stop, you know, my class to take care of that. So, you know, I think that this extra part-time person will help all around. Um, I don't think it's just going to be somebody to help mow the lawn. I think it's going to be someone who will help Tammy, who's doing four lunches by herself. She's cleaning up the lunches, you know, um, somebody to be there at Walnut, maybe a little bit more to help, you know, with the COVID issues or with just the custodial tasks that need to be done. So I just wanted to put my input to the board about just from a teacher's perspective on what um, we think and feel and how it would really benefit us and help us um, because it does take away when I have to, you know, go and mop when there's a spill or Brenda will have to come down and bring paper towels for something. She She's not at the office at that point. So just hopefully this would help with that situation. Um, so that was just my comment about that. And then I did just wanna comment um, about something Ms. Vera, Mrs. Dharma was talking about with the reading, le the reading levels for Francis and Pinnell. So speaking as an ELA teacher in the middle school and um, using Francis Pinnell uh, the last couple of years, um, one of the main things that the program actually does state is that it is detrimental to the student and their families to share their actual reading level with the families. Um, it, you know, the, the program is very big on trying to get them to be, um, you know, their self-esteem and interested in reading. So, you know, one of the things that we do is we won't share exactly the level with the students because we don't want the kids to feel bad that they're on a level M in seventh grade. You know, we would just share some of the actual specifics that we're seeing that they're they're struggling with. So I just wanted to share as to, you know, these things are shared with parents when they need to be shared, but you know, it's not, it's, it's a fine line. We, we want to instill that love of reading and that self-esteem and that choice of reading. So when they hear that they have to pick from a, a letter M, you know, whether their classmates are choosing from a V, it kind of really kills their mood of wanting to read in the classroom. So um, sometimes it's just not very, very good for them to be very specific with the parents because we don't want them to share that information. So I might say something like they're struggling with making inferences rather than saying they're on a level M. So I, that was just all I wanted to share. And um, I appreciate you letting me talk. So Absolutely. thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. We appreciate it. Okay. 
Oops. I'm sorry, my, my audio may be going in and out. I don't know. Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. Okay, does anybody else have a public comment on a non-agenda item? Uh, no. No, okay. The, All right, uh, well then, uh, Harry? Yeah, just uh, DICE had asked to use, I guess, three days a week, the school, I mean, do they pay do they pay us at all for for using the school or it's free or do it's, they it's, you know for it's, it's clean, free you know, for, having it's to free clean. for them harry and and uh anybody who wants to use the facilities fills out facilities usage forms we review them uh we would like to be able to approve everything we can't approve everything especially now uh just as miss mater was saying tammy best merle best bobby hosier wayne endicott they are they are working hard every day, all day, and and Tim Allen, of course, I mentioned him. We we don't want to put as put more strain on our custodial team. So whenever an organization is asking to use the buildings, that's what happens: is that our custodial team now has additional work. So we have received forms from different organizations: uh, DISA, PTO, Recreation Commission. And we've considered each of the requests and we've given responses to them, but uh, it is at no cost to these organizations if, if they use them. So it is a cost to the school board to make sure that all that facility is clean properly. And that's what becomes an issue because a lot of schools, same thing, you, you charge for whomever is using the facility to have the, uh, uh, janitor or have a maintenance person basically there that's just something we need to consider but like i say once again you know the school board is given stuff that it to the township which is great that's how it should be but at the same time we shouldn't be having to struggle to the degree that we are you know it's just when organizations use a school building they you know if it's a a strong union they don't even let you in the building <laughs> you go to go to camden and try to do an after school program without having to pay the uh you know the custodial staff good luck and not just there a lot of places it's just doing business but i i like the idea that we can provide that but it shouldn't be at a cost to us. That's where I'm coming from with it. We're recognized at the, you know, the city, the community level and the township level that, you know, there are these little things. Think about, you know, there, the, the library and there used to be two people that the town was paying and now we've, we're paying one of them and much better than the township well, was. Well, Harry, that's separate. So I, I want to make sure that's accurate. Uh, we do have a staff member who works for us that also works for the library. That, that does not mean we're paying that staff member's total salary for what they do for the township. Right. Right. But that person... What they do for the district as a teacher. Okay, that's fine. But they're, they're what, part-time, not a full-time teacher? Part-time teacher, yes. I just want to make sure it's accurate. Yeah, no, yeah, no, 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 that's, the library that's staff a member better, better accurate description of it. Yeah, I didn't realize she was still working the other, what she had done before she started working for us. I didn't realize she was still doing that. So that's on me. So thanks for clarifying that, Joe. Okay, um, if there's no other questions for public comment on non-agenda items, I'll close that aspect of the meeting. Um, there obviously is a need to go into executive session. Before I, um, you know, I bring that up, uh, Joe, will you be sending the board members a special link for executive session? So there is a, a way to access a breakout room, which is what we could do. Uh, but what I was gonna say uh, for the sake of the board, uh, for the sake of the public and everyone involved is, you know, our meeting has already lasted three hours and 15 minutes. What I would ask is that this topic be discussed during the October 20th meeting, knowing that we've already reviewed the entire agenda. This gives the board members more time to look at the goals 
uh, and consider uh, anything related to those goals. And then a more thorough discussion could take place in executive on the 20th. I'm all in favor of that. I feel, does anybody else oppose that direction? I'm in favor of that also. Thank you, Joe. Yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm requesting a motion to table those items. <laughs> I, I, so, so move, Joe. <laughs> Joe's recommendation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, if that's the case, we will then move forward from that aspect of the agenda, and then I will make a motion to adjourn. Do we have to vote on that with Joe? Ed? Do, do we need a vote on that? Uh, okay. you, if you've made a, I, I thought it was just a motion made in jest. If you want an actual motion to table, then you could do a voice vote to table. Um, or the, or the uh, board president can just exercise executive privilege and rearrange the agenda. Whatever you want to do. Okay, that sounds like a good option. Yeah, I think that I'm just going to exclude that aspect of the agenda and we can revisit it at next week's meeting. I think that that's a fine thing to be able to do. And I think everybody's in agreement to do so. <coughs> um, so therefore, I then make it a- so we're just getting started. Yeah. Aye. No, no, Aye. no. So I make a motion to adjourn. I saw second. Phil and Bob second that. Phil motioned and Bob seconded it. And I, you guys have a wonderful evening. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. All right. Bye-bye, Good night. Bye. Good night. Thank you, Joe. Good night, everyone.